Welcome to your sanity safe space with your favorite YouTube podcast duo. Skag three, whoever he is. Get your plug fascist ass out of here! Saving the millennial generation in weekly installments. You are a terrific team on all counts. Live from a castle tower and his mother's basement, this is, is the Matt and Blonde Show. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true and international over to perk. <laughs> Hey, why the fuck is the gas so hot, bitch? Mayor Scott, if you choose to do so, to respond to the tomfoolery uh, and attacks on you for having the nerve to be black and also a mayor. I know, and we all know, and you know very well, that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist. And what they mean by DI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, we know what they want to say. The N word. You know what the N word is? <laughs> oh, man. You serious? The fact that I don't believe in their untruthful and wrong ideology scares them. Their way of life of being comfortable while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk and they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life. Ah! I doubt it. You are fake news. Go back to where you come from, okay? Very fake news. I will eat your ass. I'll do it. That's disgusting. It's not against the law, ho. Fuck you. Let's go, Brandon. That's a big game, man. All right, America, go to the YouTube right now. Big ups to Rebecca for keeping Matt woke. Congratulations to both of you. You're awesome. All right, go, go. In five, four, three. I can't do it. We'll do it live. <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live. Hello and welcome to the show. It is a great show. It is a terrific show. It is a tremendous show. Frankly, the very best you can ask anyone about that. People often do, I'm told. My name is Mike. I, how many times have I done this? I flubbed it. Start it over. Start it over. How did you okay. fuck up the part where you say your name? <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm so confused because I don't know what day it is. Is it Easter? Is it Trans Day? I Whatever. I, I don't know. Yeah. You know it's definitely clearly. Trans Day. That is clearly more important than the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Three, two, one. This is... <laughs> The Matt and Blonde Show. My name is Matt Christensen. and I'm flanked on my right, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Blonde. Welcome. What I was going to say is, happy Easter of trans visibility. And if you haven't heard the latter part of that holiday, well, that's because obviously you haven't been paying attention to the last 15 years of celebrating Trans Visibility Day on March 31st. We always do this. What's, what's the big deal? We always have Tranny Day on March 31st. I don't know I don't know what you're so upset about. It's yeah. just a big coincidence this year that the two holidays happen to land on the same day. But I do notice that one is getting what appears to be priority from the White House and many associated with it. So I, I, the question is, who made the real sacrifice? Jesus Christ or the Trannies? We will discuss. Uh, that, that's what Easter is now about. But what, what are you gasping at? I don't know. It's so sacrilegious. Like, I just I'm going to cringe my pants off when, when we show the show art for the movie reviews. Well, well, the bit must go on. So if you're going to ask us to watch The Passion of the Christ. There are going to be AI face swaps. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's that's just the way it works. But I think it's pretty fair. I don't want to spoil anything, but I was worried about the prospect of that. I, I'm glad that you ended up as both Jesus and Satan, because if one is blasphemous the other corrects that problem i think bad enough i'm working on easter but this <laughs> it's bad enough you're a woman working at all i mean what are we doing touche yeah. yeah well so if we don't you know if if, if uh, the white house stuff isn't controversial enough i suppose we'll create some of our own but we'll get uh, we'll we'll figure out what exactly today's holiday even is uh plus a mysterious woman uh, a mysterious woman face punching spree Breaks out in New York City. I guess you're lucky you don't live there anymore. You might get punched in the face just walking down the street. Tim Pool had the most retard, brain dead take on this. Yeah, but he, I think he was trolling, was he not? He always what trolls fucker, on Twitter. You know? I, what he, all he said was like, it's funny, didn't he? He said like, yeah. it's hilarious that people are getting punched. It's I, only chicks. Frankly, like, I would. Oh, yeah. 
lol, all these minorities are beating the shit out of white women. Hilarious. I'm laughing so hard. He's like, well, they're probably Democrats. It's like women. This is why we shouldn't vote. I mean, what do you want? It's not long yeah. until women are not going to be uh, allowed out in public without a male companion. We're right on the Great. cusp. I'm, yeah, fine. All right. I'm there. Joe Biden makes a record fundraising haul from millionaires, all while insisting he's really looking out for the little guy. What a great dude. Glad to have him. Plus, we'll catch up on the latest from the Baltimore Bridge collapse. And among other entries of hoax hate this evening, does Blonde have a credible alibi to eliminate her as a suspect in this drive-by slurring of women's college know, basketball players in Coeur Unfortunately, I do. And the, I don't think the police or the FBI are on it because I told a bunch of people on Twitter that I did this and I have not been contacted by any police agency. You, so you, My husband had the truck, so it couldn't have been me. You were actually trolling on Twitter saying I did it just to see what would happen? And yeah. nobody, nobody came no, knocking? Nobody, nobody hmm. came, yeah. All right. Plus, we have some surprise cringe. And as I mentioned, tonight's movie review is appropriately The Passion of the Christ. So stick around. We'll catch up with your Super Chats in between topics as well. Ten bucks and up on the Sunday show because we are no good low down money grabbers. It will be all this and more on your favorite couple hours of listening material. Remember, you can find everything show related and support the show for as little as a buck a month. Over on the website, that is MattChristensenMedia.com. Listener support is hugely appreciated, and it is what keeps the show operational. So if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the show. We also have show merchandise for sale on the site as well. Plus, we have offers from friendly listener-owned businesses. This week's feature business is our friends at Western Razor Company. Most razors sold today are made in China by global conglomerates that hate you. Well, not anymore. The High Noon Safety Razor from Western Razor is made in America with all-metal, no-plastic, long-lasting construction that uses widely available double-edged razor blades that only cost pennies each. Safety razors were used by just about every man in America back in the 50s and the 60s until the big razor companies figured they could make more money selling you disposables and signing you up for endless subscriptions. But the safety razor has always been the superior method for a better shave at a lower long-term cost. And now... Western Razor's infamous High Noon Safety Razor is available in exotic ceramic-coated colors. Freedom coats, they call them. There's pink, black, white. There's mil-spec green. And that's on top of the shiny gold and rose gold finishes also available. Or, of course, you can't go wrong with the classic chrome finish either. The classic is always dependable. I've been using it for years now. And that simple design never fails. And don't forget, Western Razor has also teamed up with fellow listener-owned business Kineo Mountain Woodsmithing to offer finely crafted wood razor cases as well, available in walnut or maple, store or carry your razor, with exquisite style and organization. Also manufactured here in the United States of America, Western Razor has all your shaving needs covered from razors to blades to accessories and even shave cream. So, shave better and less expensively. And support American manufacturing. When you pick up a Western Razor, get 10% off your entire order using promo code MAT10 at checkout. That's promo code MAT10 for 10% off everything from Western Razor. Find everything you need from Western Razor. Plus other great offers from the rest of our friendly listener-owned businesses like Hero Soap Company, Phoenix Ammunition, Hope Innovations, and more. MattChristensenMedia.com slash deals. Deals by listeners, for listeners. And of course, don't forget, all three of our signature soaps are still available from Hero Soap Company. You can try Timberline and Old West from yours truly, or Oat plus Almond from Blonde, or try all three. Plus Hero Soap is also offering shampoo, conditioner, and even cologne. Promo code MCLISTENER. For 10% off everything at HeroSoapCompany.com. More information available at MattChristensenMedia.com slash deals as well. Okay, a couple housekeeping items before we hop into the news. Uh, just in case you're interested in my full thoughts on the, uh, the Stephen Crowder, not gay Jared controversy, I broke that down on my Wednesday show, the Matt Christensen. That was Island. like... No exaggeration, one of your finest videos, and it was basically off the cuff on, on a Wednesday show. Uh, well, I, I had a lot of prep in it. Thank you for the compliment. But It was uh, very, it was excellent. And it, it might just be juxtaposed to the absolutely retarded takes that I am hearing from people on this one. 
Lauren Southern also made a really good video about this where she broke it down. Yeah, she just posted that uh, yesterday, I think, or maybe mm-hmm. Friday night. I can't remember. Um, but uh, TLDR, big questions on both sides that I broke down. For Jared, why is he involved in another man's marriage and divorce? He's hinting that he does have a very good reason to be involved, so we shall see. For Steven Crowder, did he actually do the stuff that Jared is alleging? Did Crowder stop Jared from working elsewhere? Did he coerce Jared into signing that NDA on Jared's departure? Why is Crowder still going so aggressively on this NDA? Even beyond communication just related to the divorce proceeding, at least it appears based on who he's seeking to investigate uh, Jared's communications with. Bottom line, the biggest question for me is, is why won't Crowder let Jared talk about anything without the threat of a lawsuit? Jared's so obviously the good guy. Let's hear from him on fair terms or obviously the bad guy, rather, from Crowder's perspective. Let's hear from the guy on fair terms. He will quickly be revealed as the bad guy if he is, in fact, the bad guy. But uh, you can find that episode of the Matt Christensen Hour on my homepage or the podcast page of my website, mattchristensenmedia.com. Available. Pretty sad we're not talking about this, though. Well, do you have a take that you want to offer? I mean, I, I don't mean to exclude you from the analysis. I'm just all around disappointed in people's reaction. Um, You know, I, I the the hate of Pearl is so strong. That, like, <laughs> I got I, sucked I into it because they kept pushing the tweets to me. I don't want to see her tweets anymore. I don't even follow But, her. you know, I, I do want um women to look at this and be like, this is what... Uh, a lot of men on the right think of stay at home moms. Pearl's most retarded take was like, my sister's a daycare worker and she makes like how much money, like $20 an hour. So that's how much the duties of, uh, of a mother are worth. It's like, that's insane. You cannot replace the value of a, of a mother in the home. Um, it, it just, it just infuriates me, but, but I want women to consider this when they're genuinely looking into traditionalism, like there is going to be a major segment of the population that thinks that a retard could do your job and that it's a worthless job to begin with. And, and, and that's just the fact of the matter. And that's what, how, what we're seeing playing out here. Yeah. The, the Although idea she that had a nanny who was working a lot. And that's the question I have for her. She being Hillary Crowder. She had a nanny that one week worked a hundred hours. It's like, what the fuck were you doing? She stayed home. Uh, I assume probably like filing responses to all the litigation against her. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> No, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I, that's a fair question because obviously um, I agree with the premise that any old daycare worker is not interchangeable with the mother of my children. That's a preposterous premise. Um, yeah. But yeah, as far as the it, that whole the whole development was crazy because it started out with Jared finally talking after like five or six years. Everybody's wondered what the hell happened. And then the Crowder response. In fairness to them, they're saying that Jared's meddling in the marriage and that's why they're going after him legally. But it really got. It, it turned into a look what Hillary Crowder is doing type thing. Yeah. Look at all this. Look at all this stuff that she's doing. You know, they're saying that's related to Jared. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But but they filed, filed an entirely different civil litigation to try to squeeze her in the divorce proceedings. So like this twenty five thousand dollars, I, I doubt that that even covers her legal fees on a monthly basis. Don't know. I just want to know why Jared can't talk. That's... Well, without getting too specific, I know a lot of people that have worked with and for Crowder and the all around consensus is that he is a fucking asshole. Like that is all I've ever heard about him, that he sucks to work for, that his work environment is terrible. Well, our legal defense is coming out of your paycheck. Cause... Cool. <laughs> go nuts. Because we Once just received again... a cease and desist in the mail. Yeah, but everybody's yeah. like, oh, and Benjamin's so crazy. So fucking crazy. Da, 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 da. And then like every five years we look back and we're like, huh. How about that? How about that Owen that was that's been talking about how Crowder's a faggot douchebag for like six years now? Come at me, Crowder. I don't, I don't give a crap. As I Not said, this to, show though. As I said to start my segment on the scan, on the controversy, uh, it, it's a it's an interesting spot for me because that show was formative for me in in my viewpoints. It was also a huge opportunity for my um, quote unquote career, if you want to call it that. But I, I was on that show in 2016 and that's how a lot of people found me. So on the one hand, like I have, I have a lot of questions about what the hell's going on there. On the other, I will always be grateful for the opportunity that was provided to me. I don't want to let that cloud my judgment, but um, I will withhold some of the meaner words that you've decided to use. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, you have it all out. You, you've hated on Pearl. You've hated on Stephen Crowder. I, I think that's, I think that's it. Oh, I did want to also bring up the possibility that Hillary might be insane. I don't know her personally. I have it's no possible knowledge, that yeah. Stephen is a megalomaniac, narcissist, abusive piece of shit. But it's also possible that she's uh, totally impossible to live with. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything I, about. I her don't know personally. anything about. I have her. No idea. Yeah, couldn't speculate. Uh, hey, I have a uh, uh, another personal update on the DVT. DVT. Deep vein thrombosis. DVT. I spoke with a blood specialist doctor on Monday about the uh, blood test results that I discussed the other week when we had the show that was banned on YouTube. And he said, uh, you don't have any blood. There's just nothing was, in there. I mean, it's just as mysterious as that. But I'm now six months post uh, post DVT. I have I've been off blood thinners for a month. So I had my blood tested. Nothing came back abnormal. The doctor Crazy. confirmed there is no more clotting left in my bloodstream, which is good news. Of course, the bad news is, which isn't really bad, but it's just annoying. The DVT or the blood clot that I experienced in August is and will remain a total mystery. I have no genetic abnormality. I have no identifiable risk factor or anything abnormal about my blood. They tested for dozens of things that could be potential indicators of a problem. The only thing that came back weird was I had low blood, uh, low blood sugar after eating breakfast, which was kind of strange. And the doctor agreed that that was sort of strange Maybe an indicator of like an endocrine problem, but not necessarily blood clotting. So she tested me again and then my blood sugar came back normal. So even that was not a red flag. Interesting. Uh, And so I said, well, I'm not going to take the blood thinners anymore since I don't have any more clotting and I don't really see any reason to take them. She said, you will take these. No, she said it was fine. right? Yeah, she said that was reasonable. Uh, She said that my risk for recurrence declined significantly after two years. So I'm on DVT watch until Labor Day 2025. But other than that... It's not so bad. It's not like you have an elevated... I mean, I'm sure you have an elevated risk for life, but it's not like it's super high for the rest of your life. No, she said recurrence is... The risk is is elevated for the next two years. So if I make it for the next year and a half without a recurrence... She says the the risk drops significantly after that. So I just kind of... What a Don't um, I'm convinced it was that finger infection that you had, but a doctor wrote me and he was like, uh, you're retarded. Stop talking. So I don't I, know. I don't. I've I've done my own research, which is frowned upon, but I, I've seen you know plenty of discussion of blood infections being associated with clotting. I don't know. That's the best explanation I have. But yeah, to, in fairness to the critics, the doctor, this doctor doesn't seem particularly concerned with that. So. Other than that, the investigation is now closed. No answer. My DVT is forever an unsolved mystery. We'll see if I can make it to two years without another one. But uh, the controversy of the weekend is, uh, is of course, that Easter, it hasn't, it'd be inaccurate to say canceled. It's just, uh, it corresponds with transgender day of visibility. The explanation that we're that we're supposed to accept is that Transgender Day of Visibility is this. It has this long storied history of celebration on March 31st, and Easter just so happens to land on March 31st this year. So this is not disrespect to Easter; it's just coincidence. And by the way, uh, Transgender Day of Visibility today, March 31st. That's not to be confused with Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is. Around Thanksgiving, I had this realization yesterday. After Wait, this is White that House. the one where everybody holds hands in a circle about all the tranny prostitutes that have been killed? Yes, yeah, all the uh, victims, uh, all the all the justice brought about uh, in the aftermath of a fraudulent blowy. That's right, that's right, the, right. so. Th- I had this realization that the uh, the, the 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 trans people now they are like the military they have two days one is for the ones who are still alive and the other is for the ones who are dead they have like trans memorial day and then just Come tranny on. day and today's tranny day it's not trans mm-hmm. memorial day it's just tranny day so the controversy began on friday when the uh, the biden white house released a proclamation to honor transgender day of visibility for today march 31st because of course we don't have enough trans visibility in society Everyone's eyelids must be peeled back even further to see even more trannies. That is our country's problem at the moment. And yes, as the critics will say, they've done a transgender transgender visibility day proclamation for the last three since Biden's been president. So since 2021. 
But this this proclamation is several paragraphs long. Uh, transgender Americans are part of the fabric of our society. The Ow. proclamation reads. And so therefore, I, Joe Biden, president of the United States, blah, blah, blah. I hereby proclaim March 31st, Transgender Day of Visibility. And I call on all Americans to join us in lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout our nation and to work toward eliminating violence and discrimination based on gender identity. So, so they uh, reassigned the meaning of Easter. <laughs> ah. uh, yes, I, I suppose I suppose you could put it that way. And that's what you're supposed to think about on this Sunday, March 31st. You're supposed to think about all <laughs> the uh, dangers that are present for transgender people in the United States. In addition to, you know, the other guy who died on the cross and stuff says devout Catholic Joe Biden. But. Uh, as I mentioned, you don't understand. There's nothing abnormal about this at all. We've been celebrating Transgender Day of Remembrance since 2009. Uh -huh. Even though Joe Biden has never tweeted about it on his at Joe Biden account like he did uh, today. Never tweeted about it before, at least on this account, uh, in the 15 year history of uh, of the holiday. He's never acknowledged it on the at Joe Biden account. Well, but but both holidays can be acknowledged simultaneously, right? Just because you're thinking of all the transgender suffering doesn't mean you can't simultaneously acknowledge and respect Easter, right? It does, yeah. It well, does. Uh, some might make that argument. But uh, number one, um, we don't need transgender visibility day. There's, there's nothing to celebrate about delusional, self-worshipping nonsense. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can take the tranny's word for it. No matter how much unearned visibility they get, they end up disproportionately mentally ill and dead. Oh, it's all the bullying. It's all the bullying. They have the president of the United States constantly pushing this. But yeah, it's the bullying. That's, that's I don't know, it. man. I might have to take an easier uh, stance, like a less harsh stance on trans youth after this next Benedict story, which is the most tragic thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, there's a reason why many of them do become that, but it's not because they're trans. You know, I, I will take your point that uh, abuse is an explanatory factor in many of these stories. I would. No, no, they're not getting abused because they're trans. Right. They're trans because they were abused. Correct. I mean, so um, nobody's going to talk about that. Abused children mm -hmm. day of visibility might be more worthwhile. And perhaps there's a lot of overlap. It's just, we name it something that it isn't that I can understand, but, uh, but you know, oh, we can celebrate both days simultaneously. It can be tranny day and Easter. All right. But you can see which of the two holidays is priority for devout Catholic Joe Biden. We got the white house graphics team or the campaign graphics team. I don't know which they make up a fancy graphic trans rights or human rights. Biden tweets that out earlier today. And right below that, uh, oh, and also um, Happy Easter and stuff. No graphic. We don't don't use resources to celebrate Easter. Just make it the minimal possible acknowledgement. It's just parody at this point. The, I literally uh, didn't believe this when I read it. I was like, nope, that can't be real. <laughs> I don't have the yeah. Easter statement in front of me because in fairness, the White House did put out a statement for Easter. But the transgender proclamation is 700 words. You can see it here. It's it's paragraphs upon paragraphs. The Easter recognition is one seventh of that. It is under 100 words. So to act like this is not that, that tranny day is not being obviously prioritized over Easter is is contrary to all available evidence. Yesterday, Karine Jean-Pierre tweeted about tranny day on behalf of the White House. And uh, no corresponding tweet about Easter at all other than to debunk the other claim about Easter, uh, which mm -hmm. is that the White House egg design contest is not allowing religious symbols or iconography. Which, um, which is true, but uh, to be fair to Karine Jean-Pierre, needs context. Uh, the New York Post reported that the White House hosted an Easter egg design contest for children of National Guard families. The flyer for the uh, contest says that design submissions must not include any questionable content. 
religious symbols, overtly religious themes or partisan political statements. Hmm. But that, too, is just part of the norm, uh, a, a wild exaggeration of what we always do otherwise. Per CNN, the American Egg Board, which has organized the event for 45 years, says um, this no religious symbolism rule has long been the standard to avoid violating federal anti-discrimination law, among other reasons. But that's the thing about normalizing this nonsense and chasing traditional faith away from any presence in public life. What's actually degenerate becomes normal over time. Normal and good are not synonyms. So whenever someone are, well, whenever someone makes that argument, well, what's 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 the problem? This is normal. We do this all the time. Things that are normal can be very wrong, especially when we do them repeatedly, as we have over the course of the last decade or so. And uh, this would be one such episode. Just because we've headed in this direction for years doesn't mean that now isn't a great time to reverse that direction. If we uh, put some critical thought to it. But uh, it's not just Joe Biden and the White House. Did you see what Kathy Hochul is up to? Yeah. Same thing in the state of New York. She ordered various New York landmarks to be lit up today in trans pride flag colors, including Niagara Falls, One World Trade Center, Empire State Plaza, and more. Was there any recognition for Easter in this grandiose way? Of course not. But, oh, that's religion. They can't do that. Uh, they can't do That's why they can't put, uh, you know, a cross or a picture of Jesus on the egg design. That, that's religious. And that would violate the First Amendment somehow. And we have non-discrimination law against that. What about all of this tranny stuff is non-religious in nature? And I don't even like to say that because that implies that there's something wrong with traditional faith. I just mean how do you separate these two ideologies? On what basis would you say that the promotion of one is flatly illegal, but the promotion of the other is totally fine? It makes no sense. Yeah, propaganda. Decades of propaganda. Yeah. I mean, they, they, are, they are both ideologies, and I would say they're similar only in that regard. Again, it is not my intent to say there's no meaningful distinction between traditional Christian faith and devotion to the teachings of transgenderism. I'm just saying they're both ideologies to say that one has no place in the public sphere and the other obviously does makes no sense unless you're just to your point hostile to one and seeking to eliminate it from any public presence. Yeah. You keep approaching these things like you're like, you're going to figure it out because it's irrational. Like they don't give a shit. They hate you. They hate us. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, they, they, and that's, that's, I was trying to figure this out I was like, what, what are we looking at here? And I'm not so naive as to think, um, oh, this is uh, this is just, you know, honest people upholding traditions that are long established since 2009. Tranny Day is uh, is obviously the norm. We do it every year. When I say fair to ask what's going on here, I, I think there are a couple possibilities. Um, do these people hate Christianity? Yes. Yes, I, I would. I would say so. Uh, even if you don't think this particular episode it, of it is very persuasive, maybe you think, ah, they celebrate this every year, it just happens to land on Easter. Okay. In every other context, though, they absolutely hate Christian faith and view it as an obstacle and a threat to everything they want to do. And that's why they undermine it at every chance they get. But I thought this, um, this tweet from uh, Ian Carroll was interesting. If you think a step ahead, is this actually bait? Because I think many a Democrat would love to have a crazy right wing Christian fundamentalist, Christian nationalist commit some sort of attack. And I don't think it's at all unreasonable to see a lot of this as intentional stick poking. Come on, do a Christian do terrorist thing. attack. Come on. <laughs> yeah. They would love nothing more than a campaign against something like that, especially if they if they had Trump baited into it and. I'm not saying he's wrong to respond to this, but if you can if you can lay the bait and have Trump comment on it and then have some kind of unrest that results. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all those pieces come together over the weekend. Trump's press secretary called Biden's tranny day proclamation part of a years long assault on Christian faith and said the Trump campaign calls on Biden and the White House to issue an apology. Trump um, or yeah, so they, they said, you know, uh, it's appalling and insulting. We call on Biden to to issue an apology is what they said. So if you can get that headline, Trump fuels Christian attack. Oh my God. That would be better than January 6th. If they could get that. 
Yep. So I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, it, do you think that's at all to, it, is this just uh, your normal run of the mill tranny propaganda or do you think it's uh, something more cynical? Maybe. I mean, they're always trying to bait us, aren't they? This was particularly absurd though. I, I literally thought it was a Babylon Bee thing when I read it. I was like, <laughs> this can't be real. I saw it. Yeah. Uh, I saw the news start to break. I think yesterday, yesterday morning. And, um, and then, you know, I saw that, that they do this every year and I'm like, okay, that does make sense. I mean, it, it makes sense insofar as Biden has acknowledged this stupid made up holiday for the last three years in a row. But, um, if it had some corresponding, like if they went just as aggressively for Easter with devout Catholic Joe Biden, all right, maybe, maybe, but it's pretty clear which holiday is being prioritized from the white house's perspective. And it's, um, it's not the one that devout Catholic faith would suggest is important, but what else is new? I and mean, this is a guy that wants to industrially harvest babies. I know. Yeah. <laughs> According to his Catholic faith as well. You know how we so. were talking about Andrew Clavin? Yeah. And I was saying that he was trying to subvert Christianity. I, I think that Joe Biden is basically doing the same thing with Catholicism. Like how it's, can you possibly be pro-life and be like, Oh, I'm Catholic. It's like that is an assault to basic fundamentals of Catholicism, but okay. Like You mean pro-choice, not pro-life, right? Or did I hear Oh, wrong? that's what I meant to say. Yeah. I'm and functionally not, retarded since I had a baby. So you're going to- And not just pro-choice, but yeah. pro-choice to I mean, an absolutely absurd extent. Not the not the old kind of pro-choice of like safe, legal, and rare. Safe and rare. Uh, yeah. Pro-choice uh, up, up until the point of birth for a lot of these people, no matter how many fact checks they issue saying they don't do that. Anyway, all right. Um, let's talk a little bit of. Uh, well, speaking of, you, you mentioned Clavin, but uh, Clavin was a part of that Candace Daily Wire scandal. There is an update in the Candace Daily Wire split, and I don't want to get back into this story at length because, of course, we already talked about it last week. But there is a claim about how this split may have happened. That being Candace and the Daily Wire on Thursday, the Twitter account censored man said. Uh, I'm not sure who runs this account, but but are censored men. No one no one knows, right? I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. I'm not familiar with the account, but it's a pretty big account, a lot of followers. And they have um censored men has they say they have four Daily Wire employees saying there was an impromptu town hall organized by CEO Jeremy Boring that took place in Candace's studio the day of her firing. This happened just before the split, obviously. Uh the employees said that the town hall attempted to brainwash them into accepting that Candace Owens is an anti-Semite. These employees say the subjects discussed at this town hall were Candace's repeated use of the phrase Christ is King. They say a clip of Nick Fuentes uh, saying Christ is King was used and played repeatedly in support of the idea that Candace is to be implicated by association with that phrase. They say there was a clip of Candace on the Fresh and Fit podcast as well, where a ka sound effect was played, which is believed to be a dig at Jewish people loving money. These employees also say that Ben Shapiro was personally bitter toward Candace because her show was outperforming Ben's. These employees are planning a lawsuit against the Daily Wire, according to this report, apparently for some sort of workplace hostile to Christianity, something to that effect. Obviously, all of this is just a claim. We don't have confirmation beyond a screenshot that doesn't show much. And of course, that's not necessarily confirmation at all. And I'm not sure um, the metric by which they're saying Candace was allegedly outperforming Ben. That seems like a sketchy premise. I don't know if that's uh, statistically true or not. That can't be possible. I, I have my doubts about that, but I don't know what they're citing there. Uh, I wish. <laughs> I wish that were true. <laughs> if some lawsuit gets filed, like they're saying, then I guess we'll get some confirmation to these claims. But the next day, censored men posted uh, an alleged screenshot of the email announcing this town hall. The email is redacted, so we can't even see who it's to, who it's from. The email says this is going to be a private employee only town hall. No cell phones even can't even bring your phone. Leave it at your desk. Now, that could be real or it could be just a guy writing an email to another guy and then taking a screenshot of it. There's no way to authenticate this. Hmm. Candace personally responded 
to that screenshot. And she said, uh, I was not aware of this. Maybe I should go on Joe Rogan to talk about it while pretending <laughs> not to talk about it. A reference to Ben, who has been speaking very carefully about the split lately. And uh, you can interpret Candace not knowing in one of two ways. Number one, if you believe the story is true, then I guess she was put on trial in front of the company without being offered a defense for herself. If you think the story is fake, well, then the obvious explanation here is she didn't know about it because it didn't happen because it's fake. Candace uh, did offer one additional glimpse into what's going on with the Daily Wire and with um, with Ben Shapiro. In response to Ben talking about the split, I've heard a few clips of him speaking in very broad general terms, but he has been talking about it. So she has a point that he hasn't been silent about it. Um, there, there was one appearance with Dave Rubin that Glenn Greenwald was responding to here. And Candace said uh, over the weekend, Ben, we agreed not to talk about this, but you are very much going on a public tour right now, pretending not to talk about it while you are very much talking about it. Would you like me to do the same? And um, so whatever happened there, there clearly was some kind of agreement between Candace and Ben personally, not just Candace and the company. Yeah. And the agreement was not to say anything about it, which does make it interesting because Ben's public claim, at least as far as I've seen, is that he doesn't have firing authority or influence over Candace. He's removed himself from that decision or he's, he doesn't hold an office within the company that makes that decision. If this is true, though, then he's got to be a party to that decision insofar as they agreed. I don't know. I mean, maybe I guess right. if I were trying to say he's not lying there, then maybe someone else made the decision. And because Ben and Candace have something of a feud, they just agreed as a consequence to uh, have a truce and just not talk about each other anymore. Maybe that was how it went. I don't know. But we'll keep an eye on that. Did you uh, well, do you believe that Lizzo is done? No. Okay. Uh, do you stand by your former Lizzo appreciation or was that just pregnancy? No, related? no, it's okay. just pregnancy really. It's like, um, you know how you recognize people as kin when you look like them It's because I was fat and pregnant <laughs> and I was like, this is my, these are my people. This you looked in the mirror woman. and you saw Lizzo and I saw Lizzo. Yeah. Um, okay. no, I, it's because I used to love that song feeling good as hell or whatever. Ah, like, I know that right one. when it came out. Yeah. Catch it, catch fucking song. But no, I mean, I've come to hate Lizzo, if you must know. Fine. Fresh off performing at Biden's ritzy New York City fundraiser Thursday, which we'll get to in a little bit. Do you like that picture I sent you? I, yeah, I, I, I saw it. Um, my wife showed it to me, too. And then I thought, should I save that for the show? But I couldn't find the image. I don't know when that actually happened or where you got that. Oh, so she'd seen it as well. Yeah, she showed it to me the other day because that was the second time I'd seen it. Uh <laughs> But fresh off performing at that fundraiser of Joe Biden's, uh, Lizzo says she is quitting music entirely. That's right. The fat lady is singing about the fat lady singing. One might say this is very big news. Morbidly obese news, even. And that's, ah. that's where I quit writing the jokes. I was like, oh, this, is, this is stupid. She's fat. Ha ha. But um, okay. <laughs> In a Friday Instagram post, Lizzo says in part, I'm getting tired of putting up with being dragged by everyone. And that's not true. There's not a man alive who has the strength to drag no. Lizzo. Can't help yourself, can you? Yeah. She says she just wants to make music and make people happy. But she's starting to feel like the world doesn't want her in it. She says she's constantly lied about and is the butt of the joke every single time because of how she looks. She says she didn't sign up for this. Um, okay. I mean, when, you, when you're when you a public figure, you always you sign, sign up for all of it. Yeah. So she quits with the peace sign emoji. Lizzo could not be reached for comment by the New York Times uh, over the weekend. And she has hinted at, at quitting in the past, including last year when she said body shaming comments get her close to giving up. Also potentially relevant, Lizzo faces several lawsuits from a uh, designer and her former backup dancers who say that she created a hostile work environment on tour. The judge has allowed the dancers well, the lawsuit. Old Crowder, that was in. <laughs> Maybe they end up together. Or, you know, I, I should have brought it up when you were talking about it. What if the end of this whole story is that Steven Crowder and Pearl end up together? Could you imagine? I, I've been hypothesizing that. 
Uh, so the, the judge has allowed the dancer's lawsuit against her to go to trial despite Lizzo's objections. But the good news for Lizzo is there is no way that her heart makes it until then. So <laughs> there's nothing to worry about. Uh, oh, Lizzo. I saw <laughs> just a hilarious news report on Thursday morning. But inflation, of course, has um, has ravaged our economy. Dollar stores have been a, a frequent topic in the news. And the story is usually something to the effect of what the prices aren't a dollar anymore. What a rip off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the products now cost more than a dollar to make, so they can't be sold for a dollar anymore. But by all means, keep voting for the people who pump fake money into the system and cause this effect. But it's not just the, the prices at uh, dollar stores that are the, that uh, are the story. It's also who's shopping there, at least in this report. This was uh, on NBC on Thursday morning. They were trying to solve the mystery of why prices are increasing at Dollar Tree. Some items are priced as high as seven dollars. So uh, they, they do acknowledge the reality of inflation, to be fair. It's not totally blind. But listen to this secondary explanation. Dollar Tree is attracting wealthier people to shop there. So now they cater to rich people and their rich, their rich clientele loves these uh, higher priced products. And uh, that's why we're seeing price increases at Dollar Tree. At Dollar Tree, true dollar prices are a thing of the past. The discount giant is raising prices again, some items as high as $7. The reason? A combination of inflation and an influx of higher income customers who can better afford it. Why are people who are making $100,000 a year or more shopping at a dollar store? So there's a lot of price pressures that are impacting consumers. They're going out to buy goods and services and looking for places to cut. The largest demographic, growing demographic, are yeah. folks who make, actually make a fair amount of money. Make $125,000 or more a year. And so that's why they're having this multi-price assortment, because they've got a customer who can afford higher yeah. price things. Mm. But for the people who really are chasing cheap all the time, they're like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like $7. Cool. I come here for a dollar. See, that's but the problem. On Earth I, I hate that we have to have somebody explain this to us because obviously that's what's going to happen during the inflationary period. No, don't you understand? Dollar Tree has become a house of fine luxuries. It attracts monopoly <laughs> men. Uh, <laughs> or maybe a hundred grand isn't the uh, <laughs> fancy salary that it used to be. Yeah. Maybe people who we think of as being rich aren't Are no actually rich, yeah. that rich anymore because the money doesn't buy what it used to. The story is not rich people attracted to a dollar store. Uh, the story is a six figure salary may still require some penny pinching. Now that's the story. Uh, yeah. My friends with their combined income make like 60 grand and they are like woefully poor, it, yeah. like poverty poor. And, and that's, that's what 60 grand looks like these days. Totally. And it's circumstances dependent too. You know, it's, um, I don't mean to say like, oh, poor person who has a six figure salary. That's a good chunk of money. I'm not saying it isn't, but when you have built a life where say you have a large mortgage payment or you have significant debts and you've planned your finances, assuming a certain, cer assuming certain numbers for costs. And all of a sudden those costs go up by 20% over the course of a couple of years. That hurts. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, uh, depending on what your debts are, what your spending needs are. E yeah. I mean, even if you have what is a very good salary and above average, to be clear, um, depending on your situation, you still might have to go to Dollar Tree because you did not plan on these sorts of costs hitting you the way that they have. And And if you want to lose all hope that these idiots will finally start to get it. I like to think like, okay, when people get hit in the wallet this way, they're going to realize the truth and it will be undeniable. Go read the comments section on that report on YouTube. At least half the people are still blaming corporate greed. Oh, I can't believe Dollar Tree got greedy. Come yeah. on. Dollar Tree only now realized that they, they suddenly realized they could become greedy if they mm -hmm. want to. They just need to attract rich people with exotic furs and expensive perfumes for $7. That's what happened here. Dollar Tree turned its back on the poor and said, we're open for business, Monopoly men. You want a, a monocle? You want a top hat? We sell those now. Get out of here, poors. That's <laughs> People believe this. Oh, it's so frustrating. But uh, anyway, 
Uh, do, do you believe, speaking of believing it, do you believe this story? I, I know it seems like about half of people think it's fake, but I don't know what to think about it. YouTuber kidnapped in Haiti because he tried to go meet the gang leader barbecue. No, I think it's real. Hmm. Uh, I mean, they put down $40,000 for his ransom. So it's probably who's real, they like right? his family or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't then know I guess this it must YouTuber. be. Have you ever heard of this YouTuber, your fellow Arab? Well, I saw him. Uh, I saw him speaking by phone to Sneeko, and I I know Sneeko, but I don't know this guy. I, I know of Sneeko. I don't know Sneeko personally, but except for way back when on an old podcast, <laughs> that one time. which made me leave it, which is why I started the show. It, people, Sneeko is a formative part of this show's establishment Crazy. in a bizarre way. But that's a long story. So was that other guy? What is his name? Keems Keemstar. Yeah. Weird. Um, but this guy, your fellow Arab who calls himself Arab, he went to Haiti to try to interview Jimmy Barbecue. Uh, how do you say this? I don't know. Cherizier? That sounds pretty Cherizier, good to me. Um, who's the leader of the G9 family and allies gang that has seized control of the government. 24 hours after he arrived in the country, he and a Haitian colleague were taken by members of the gang. Wow, I can't, I can't believe this happened. Held for six hundred thousand dollars rans- ransom, they put forty thousand dollars down, and the kidnappers are like, "Uh, no," <laughs> to secure his release. I don't know. I think he's going to get killed. I didn't even. I wasn't even aware that people thought that this was some kind of hoax. People get kidnapped well, in Haiti all the time. Like when what? I when I heard him talk to Sneeko, he was addressing that point and saying, "No, I'm I'm here with the kidnappers, and they say that I don't have to wear a bag over my head because they think I'm cool, but they're still pointing guns at me." <laughs> I didn't have time to prep the clip, but it's on Twitter. So you're cool. we won't kill you. We'll only torture you. Well, I, I didn't know what to think of it because, I mean, he's talking like he's in that situation. But then I like you're on FaceTime while a Haitian gang has you in their custody. Why would they allow you to FaceTime your friend? That's what was giving me because 64 doubt. IQ. I guess. Is, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but you're projecting your big brain, multiple folds in your brain. It's not that big, on these Haitians. <laughs> it might be. It might be elite for Haiti. I will take the compliment, but I don't know about the rest of uh, the world. Anyway, it's not much competition except for Karine Jean-Pierre, the most elite of all Haitians. Yeah, really? Anyway, she really is. Um, so how long do you think Sam bankman fried is going to spend in jail? Uh, well, so the sentence is what? 25 years? He's it's going 25 years. But like biggest Democrat donor, I can't imagine if he spends five years in jail. I'll be pretty surprised. Well, all he has to do is like uh, if he starts punching women in the face, they'll let him out. He has, yeah, to, he has to be a little more violent. Then he'll get released. Yeah. The way things are going. But he talks like this, so I don't think he's going to punch any women in the face. Will he do enough push-ups in prison to get rid of those man boobs? Inquiring Never. minds want Never. to know. And what about his vegan diet? I bet that's out the window. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah. jurors only needed three hours of deliberation to convict him. People were like, uh, fuck you, dude. Well, he was already um, convicted, right? This, this is uh, sentencing. Sentencing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sentenced on all seven criminal counts. And this is what the judge said. I find the loss amount readily exceeds $550 million. The top tier for sentencing, I find investors lost 1.7 billion, lenders lost 1.3, and customers eight billion dollars. Jeez, man! Three suicides associated with FTX. I didn't know um, that. Well, he I did more I... damage than uh, Bernie Madoff. It seems like. Um, and then I, he I also don't know. got. Yeah, I, I should check who who was the bigger fraud. I don't know the answer to that question. I think Sam Bankman Fried. Um, I don't know if adjusting for inflation. I'm actually not sure how much damage Bernie Madoff did. Um, and also convicted of, uh, charged and convicted obstruction of justice because he texted the former general counsel. And so he, um, he was, it was constituted as witness tampering. So he made okay. three perjury findings based on trial testimony. So yeah, 240 months, a total of then consecutive 60 for a total of 300 months, which is 25 years. My quick search from um, what may be an unreliable source, one of those question and answer websites says Bernie Madoff defrauded investors of twelve billion, Sam Bankman freed two billion. Mm. But that's not what this says. This says Eight this source that you have. Yeah, I mean, this is talking about. So I, I don't know. The, uh, co- probably comparable, if that's correct. Bernie Madoff's son also committed suicide. Uh, when did that happen? 
Mm, I don't know. And I actually don't know if he was intimately involved in any of the dealings of his father or if it was just the familial shame that led to a suicide. Um, I actually don't think he was involved. The wife was probably pretty, but was the son? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know uh, anything about how all that uh, played out with his family. But okay, well, we'll see how long it takes for Sam Bankman Freed to be out. Uh, I guess that means what his girlfriend, Caroline, what's her face? She um, she yeah. flipped and she's free in all this, right? So she's on the market if uh, anyone wants to pick her up. They don't. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about the the Biden fundraiser. Really, the juxtaposition here. And and before the break, we might just have time to get into the fundraiser. But uh, on Thursday and and later in the week, it was it was two strongly contrasting campaign season uh, campaign scenes rather. Joe Biden appeared with Obama, Bill Clinton, and rich celebrities like, as I mentioned, Lizzo. Uh, at this New York City fundraiser while Trump went to the funeral of a New York City police officer killed on duty. But this uh, this Biden fundraiser was uh, at Radio City Music Hall, and Joe Biden's campaign hauled in a record $26 million. That would be the record for most money raised in a single political event in U.S. history, reports say. Uh, Stephen Colbert hosted the event. Again, Lizzo was there. Queen Latifah, Mindy Kaling. Oh, geez. This was a this was like a Hollywood uh, event. Uh, tickets alone were two hundred and twenty five bucks. And if you really shelled out the money, you could get a lot more special treatment. You could get a photo with all three presidents for one hundred thousand oh dollars. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollar donation. Would do that. You get special reception access to these presidents. Five hundred thousand dollars is the full Epstein. They give you it's it, straight to the island. You can have whatever you want. Uh, but seriously speaking, I don't I don't know how that's. I don't understand the financial arrangement here. I don't understand how that's legal because there are federal campaign contributions. Uh, those are currently thirty three hundred dollars per candidate, forty one k for party committees. Or so where's this money going? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, is this going to some technically unaffiliated political action committee? Is that how they're how they have people giving this kind of money, like six figure donations? Are they probably right? Are the, is the money getting <laughs> split into different boxes? Like you give the max to Biden, and then a bunch of the money goes to like Democrat congressional campaigns or something. I'm guessing it's something like that. I don't. I just don't understand the technicals of this. I'm not even alleging that it's illegal to the extent it's out in the open. I doubt it is. I just uh, I, I I don't understand the technicals of where the money is going. That's all. But whatever the case, this was an elite club of millionaires who gathered to shovel money at their guy, Joe Biden. Well, they actually try to convince you that they give a rat's ass about the common man to any degree beyond their taking of his tax money. That's really the only use they have for him. There were no cameras allowed at this event generally. But this morning I caught a clip of Obama speaking at the event and he was um he was saying the election is as simple as Biden cares about you and Trump doesn't. And uh, I had to record this one on my phone cuz it was the only way I could grab the clip so bear with the crappy quality but you'll hear what he said. At the end of the day, who do you think is actually going to look out for you? Who do you think is going to fight on your behalf? Who is it that really sees you and cares about you i can't <laughs> i'm pretty confident the other guy does this guy does <laughs> uh yes joe biden cares about you so much that he has to go shake down rich elites for money while otherwise condemning rich elites as greedy uh that's a good strategy, though, to appeal to the leftists like like you you actually care if your president cares about you and your interests personally. Right. Like, yeah. I just want him to create. A, I, don't, I don't care if he's totally disinterested in who I am or my demographic as a person. If he creates a functional society and a yes. functional financial system, I'm like, OK, I don't know. I don't give a shit about you caring about me. Yeah. His job is. Uh, the enforcement of federal law as constitutionally restrained. His job is representing the United States in foreign matters and defending the United States, which uh, you know he's not doing 
that latter part, certainly. But yeah, you're hitting the the big point there, which is why do I care at all if he cares about me? I I don't care if he cares about me and I shouldn't because he'll never care about me as much as my family does or my friends do or my neighbors do. Those are the people who need to care about me. Right, yeah. I think you're exactly right that he needs to care about the system in which everyone can operate freely, functionally, and pursue prosperity. What an insight in the leftist, though. Yeah, well, the president has to care about... The president has to... You know, look at me with sympathy as though that does anything, uh, as though that improves your life in any way. It's like when people say that they need to feel seen and heard. You know? Yeah, but that's like that's what a chick says to her husband or something, you know, it's not what, it's <laughs> when not they're your, fighting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I just I look at an event like this. I cannot believe in the same way I look at the dollar store story and think I cannot believe anybody actually believes that prices are increasing at Dollar Tree because they're suddenly catering to a new rich clientele. I can't believe anybody looks at this event and think, yep, that's Joe Biden. That's Scranton Joe. I bet he took the train from Delaware to this event in New York. That's all, that's all he does. He's a working class man. He probably came straight from the coal mine. That's what he did. People yeah. look at an event like this that is nothing but millionaire elites. And I don't even say that with scorn, okay? I don't have, I'm not begrudging people who have been successful. It's not that. It's just how can you possibly be on a stage at Radio City Music Hall or whatever this is with all of these celebrities forking over hundreds of thousands of dollars, collectively millions, and then sit there and say, yeah, I, you know, really looking out for the the plight of... The little guy. Yeah, and people buy that. <laughs> how can you see that... So, uh, the premise there that Obama is saying, oh, Joe, Joe really cares about you. That's all that matters. He cares about you. who would look at this event and think that's representing me. That is clearly done for my interest. That's what I'm watching right now. They're well, all they don't looking have out for to me. be ideologically consistent because all the people that they're preaching to want to believe that anyway. I, I think they uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to put myself in a, in a mindset that is impossible, frankly, I suppose. Uh, but I, I got a kick out of this too at the event. Um, this is one event where you actually have to show valid ID. Uh, according to the National Pulse, attendees had to show valid ID with the name that matches their ticket to enter. Of course, that's not necessary for the election. In, in that case, it's racist. If there's ID at the polling place, that's racist. It's not necessary to cross the border. Also racist. If you ask who the hell is that guy crossing the border? The only time it's very important to know exactly who you are and what you're doing here is at a Joe Biden campaign event where he's telling you how much he's looking out for the little guy while taking multi-million dollar bags of money from rich people. And somehow they square this circle in their minds. How? But that's what Biden did. Uh, we're right at the top of the hour. So I'll save the, um, the New York police officer's um, funeral for after the break. But let's hop into some chats before we get into that sure uh over on rumble uh boogeyman 918 says i doubt it thank <laughs> you uh boogeyman very much appreciated aggie jet i doubt it catch the show tomorrow happy easter everyone i think you mean happy trans day of visibility <laughs> but i'll take your well wishing and happy easter to you no long pork says friendly reminder the number one call <laughs> Oh, the number one. The number one cause of anti-Semitism is the passion of the Christ. That's uh, <laughs> I, that's the that's what I'm allowed. That's the version of the chat I can say. Thank you, Nolan, for Yakko, 1977. Russia is showing the West how things are done in that they've initiated mass deportation of Muslims after the concert hall massacre here in the West, they'd probably call the shooters, the victims. I haven't heard that. They They're deporting yeah. people. They're kicking out Muslims in Russia. Is yeah, that true? Good. I, I don't know. I hope so. Uh, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to see what's going on there. I haven't followed up on that story. So thank you for the info. And, um, and thanks for supporting the show. Yakko son of the wolf says he is risen happy easter christ is king oh, they haven't banned that phrase on rumble yet i'm glad to see that happy easter likes to watch going to start uh or going to catch the replay so i can get some sleep but i still wanted to wish you both a happy easter wishing you both a great week well happy easter to you and a great week to you as well thanks for supporting the show hillbilly deluxe blonde hasn't hated on shapiro yet 
happy Easter? Do you want to take this opportunity? It's just so easy. I mean, he's destroying himself, so uh, it's fun to watch, right? Like, did you watch him on Ruben? You're an asshat. I did not. You know, it's like he said as much as he was as disparaging as he possibly could be legally. What I just what, like look at him talking. I'm like, I saw a brief talking. clip that Greenwald was re- responding to, but what he did an excellent piece on that. What was Greenwald. the substance of what Shapiro said? Because I didn't see all of it. It was just legalese about how you know he basically blamed her without saying that she was at fault. Okay, so he's he's dancing around it in general, which is what mm-hmm. I've seen him like. I saw him with Pierce Morgan, where it's like I'm not going to talk about that, Pierce. Okay, I'll talk about it, but only in the most general way. It, it invites more speculation. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <sighs> Thank you, uh, Hillbilly Deluxe. You're an asshat. Injured Guardian says Rumble has a 200 letter limit. Why? Rant. We never should have quit publicly hanging counterfeiters in the U.S. Isaac Newton was born too early to be asked to hunt them here as he did in England. I guess I haven't thought about public hangings for counterfeiters. <laughs> when we say counterfeiters, are we talking specifically with money or are we talking in other contexts? No, money. Okay. I assume. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about the history of that. And I didn't know Isaac Newton had anything to do with it. So a lot of lessons for me to learn there. Thank you, Injured Guardian. Antisocial Grunt. First time in a while, my wife and I have gotten to watch your show live. We love you guys. Happy Easter. Also curious. Which came first, the hair, the egg, or the tranny? What do you think? Uh, you have no, you're not going to guess. Are you? Hillbilly Deluxe. Uh, the tranny. The tra- trannies have been here since the dawn of time. Truly, they and- built this country or whatever. Yeah, my as we'll get to later in the show, my biggest criticism with the Passion of the Christ is they did not include Transgender Day of Visibility, which was common, <laughs> commonly honored at the. In fact, I'm pretty sure Jesus mentioned it at the Last Supper, and Mel Gibson just excluded that part for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Hillbilly Deluxe says, "To be fair, TM, not sure if you're mocking me with that, but uh, I'll take it regardless." Obama wasn't lying when he told those hundred thousand dollar donors. That creepy Uncle Joe cares about them. Well, d- were the were the uh, hundred thousand dollar donors little girls? Because then he definitely cares about them. Were they ice cream shop owners? Because then he definitely cares about them. Were they uh, pool attendees who were under the subjugation of uh, corn pop in the nineteen sixties or whatever the hell? That I don't even remember. Yeah, I mean, there's there are select groups for whom Joe Biden has concerning care. Uh, we're good on Rumble. Thank you guys over there. Good on Odyssey. Good on D Live. Let's catch up with a few on YouTube and Tippy, and we'll get back into the news. Hold on, Mulray. High truth seekers. If a child has agency to change genders in schools, uh, can't tell his parents why. Can't he similarly decide he is done with school? Seems like the former outweighs the latter. No, God bless, because they have to keep him in an indoctrination center to keep him thinking that he's trans. That's why. Yeah, it, well, to, and the the point is interesting that if you grant children that agency, like by on what basis do they have parents at all? Why are they not fully emancipated? Yeah, I mean, for what purpose is there a parent in this arrangement at all if you are old enough to decide you're actually the other gender? Yep, but exactly. Trying to make sense of the nonsensical. Thank you, Holden. Um, let's see. Bill Biz, Biden declares transgender day of visibility on Easter. Weimar 2.0. Truer words have never been spoken. Uh, it, it is an ominous sign, I would say. Thank you, Bill Biz. Tortuga, can't watch live today as my wife and I are celebrating our 17th anniversary of the day she be- legally became obligated to put up with my foolishness. Happy Resurrection Day. Congratulations. Congratulations, uh, Tortuga. His wife is so cute. I met her IRL in Japan. Cool, ah, right? yes, that's right. Amish extremist Christ yeah. is king. He is indeed. I bought PN. No note. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, I bought. Very much appreciate it. Um, incompetent hands. I am not going to be niggardly. Happy Easter. Sorry for not super chatting in a while. It's okay. <laughs> I'll apologize if I want Matt. Shut up. Oh, I, yeah. Because I always say don't apologize for supporting the show. Oh, uh, I thought I, I read that like yeah. if I want Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I no, don't know he's, why I did that. I apologize if I want, comma, Matt. Yeah. 
working 70 hours a week. So I'm flush, but I have no time to be funny. Love the AI face swaps. Not today's blonde's reaction to the Scarface one was chef's kiss. Bless you too. I don't Why have I f- what oh, the chef, uh, it's the chef, the Scarface one was the one where I was Tony Montana and you were the female love interest. That's right. And it was the dancing scene. Oh, gross. yeah. Those, um, those are always, first of all, shout out to, uh, Jamie and Janie who do the AI face swaps for us, but those are always, uh, whenever there's like a, it's a scene with like some kind of sexual tension or something. It's always very dicey. And then it's weird. Yeah. I didn't know how this was going to go. We'll get to it when we get to the movie review, but I thought, Oh man, how is he going to do the AI face swap here? But I don't I want to. I haven't watched it. Is it okay? I, th- I, I think it's going to be fine. Um, okay. Okay. I didn't want to go to him and say like, <laughs> don't don't do it this way or don't do it that way because he he does a great job and I don't want to uh, influence him that way. It's like it, I, I was worried. I'm like, okay. On the one hand, there's definitely a way that you could make this wildly offensive. On the other hand, I don't want to go the full like you can't draw Muhammad sort of standard. Yeah. Mm. So hopefully this uh, walks that line. I think it does. I, I I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out when how, with how many pissed off emails I get or not. Travis by a comedy. I dated a redhead who was super woke and in political correctness. She didn't even like it when I called her a redhead. She said, stop calling me a redhead. We're called Native American. <laughs> uh, thank you, Travis. And uh, well, first of all, a rim, a rim shot for your comedy. Uh, you almost all, said rim job. You almost did. You almost did it right I there. said rim shot. No, and in competent hands, I owe a Bernie. Thank you. I am not going to be niggardly. Thank you. Bo Cephas Blonde. This week, I'll cook a meal in a potato. Mac and cheese and bacon. Nice. Also, did your current co-host tell you to look into repping Grandma Towler's tea? Yes. You guys can order some of Grandma Towler's tea. I believe Sam uh, Malia's GoFundMe is still up. I think it was go send go slash Sam Malia if you want to give send go. What did I say? Go send go. God. (laughs) It's it's like I I have a brain tumor. Like I feel so dumb. Uh, No, it's very easy to uh, misspeak. I've done that many times. Jonathan Prezio said, did you guys color your eggs this year? I did. I did not. No, I, we didn't do any kind of Easter egg sort of thing, but um, our, our oldest, our oldest son is two and a half and he's old enough for Easter egg hunting and he really loves it. Grandma gave him uh, a, an Easter egg hunt a couple weeks ago in advance of Easter. And now because he loves Easter eggs so much, uh, we have moved him into his first big boy bed, which is maybe a little ahead of schedule because he's two and a half uh, and he can leave the bed now and open the door. And so I've been trying to condition him. I don't want to lock him in the room. So trying to condition him. If you stay in bed all night, you will get a present in the morning. And the <laughs> present is in it, it's uh, in an egg. So okay. every morning when I get it's so funny, uh, I he realizes the deal. Like it's very cool to see your children when their minds start working in that way. And and he is clearly thinking about this in business terms because when he first got in his big boy bed the other week, he comes into mom and dad's bed at like three in the morning. And it's like, okay, this is the, we got to figure out a way to keep him in the bed. So we developed this egg scheme. And I told him the other, the other night, this is one of the first times I did the deal. I said, if you stay in bed all night, daddy will give you, a present in an egg in the morning. Oh, daddy give present. He got very excited for that. And I, and I usually get him up in the morning uh, about seven o'clock. So I go in his room at 7 AM to congratulate him on staying in his bed the entire night. And he, he was straight to business. It was daddy give present. He, he knew that he had, (laughs) he knew he had fulfilled his end of the deal. And instead of just enjoying the fatherly praise for good behavior, it was, listen, man, <laughs> fuck you, give me a present. <laughs> we had a contract. Yeah. I don't want your, I don't want your bullshit. You got your end of the deal or not. Yeah. And I gave him a Hot Wheels car in an egg that was prepared by his mom. Oh. Yeah. Now Does I just have to figure that? out how to move, how to get him to do that by default and not expect a Hot Wheels car as a reward. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. My kid is keeping me up all night. I don't realize it. Um, Let's do one more. Jonathan Prezios. Yeah, about that, Owen. I guess the world is flat. Owen just shits on everyone he worked with. Not a surprise to know Crowder is a douche to work for. Crowder and Candace are not actual stories. Let's move on. We didn't talk about it this week, barely. Uh, I mean, we definitely did. But, (laughs) you know, 
I, as much as I wanted to. This divorce yeah. story has everything. That's why everybody wants to talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I understand the uh, aversion to drama. And normally I don't like to get into that sort of stuff myself. The the Crowder thing, as I mentioned when I broke it down, it's it's got a, a personal connection to me. And it also is just one of the Internet's greatest mysteries, especially in this area of the Internet, like kind of conservative alternative media, whatever. Everyone wants to know what the hell happened to not gay Jared. And we kind of have a glimpse yeah. of that now. Yeah. So I, I get it. I get it. Uh, you know, being sick with uh, sick with like infighting and drama stories, but I, I want to know the answer to that question. I've wanted to know for years. Oh yeah, me too. Totally. Yeah. Um, let's circle back. All right. Thank you guys for the chats. We will come back to them at the end of the stream. Um, I'll have to just circle back with you. And it's time to talk about uh, what Trump was doing while they were doing their um, their record setting fundraiser for Biden in New York City. Uh, the same day, Thursday, Trump attended the wake for Jonathan Diller. I still am unclear. There's a wake and there's a funeral. Am I correct in that? They're two different things. Yeah. One, OK, so this was the wake and not the funeral that Trump was at, I believe. But this was on Thursday. And to be fair, uh, Trump did a little campaigning of his own related to this event. He was talking about the importance of doing something about crime after the event. So I'm not trying to present this as like, oh, um, this is purely goodness of his heart. And this is, you know, bad guy Biden over here, even though I mean, you think he is bad guy Biden for the most part. But I'm saying Trump Trump took an opportunity politically here, too. So there's there's some of that going on. But. When you look at the contrast in the images, you got Trump at the the wake for the dead cop in New York City, and you got Biden telling you he's looking out for the little guy while accepting these bags of money. Those sorts of contrasts do matter politically. And and, um, and so it, it's just interesting to watch. If, if Biden says he cares about the little guy so much, but he's he's there accepting all this money, and Trump Trump hates the little guy so much, as Obama says, well, then why is, is Trump hanging out with the little guy? Right, right. right. Uh, in, instead of, I, would, I don't know, you, you should see it reversed, obviously, if their characterization was correct. But anyway, that's the politics of it are less important than what happened to this uh, police officer in New York City. Jonathan Diller, an NYPD officer, he was shot and killed Monday in Queens after he uh, approached an illegally parked vehicle. The man who shot him, Guy Rivera, is believed to have been casing a robbery at the time, as in kind of scanning, looking for a robbery target. So that's probably why he was parked illegally. He's looking for the place that he's going to rob. And so uh, Rivera, the uh, the guy who shot the cop in this case, he has four prior arrests, including a gun charge in New York City. But like everyone there, he's promptly released each, each and every time. Uh, upon approaching the car, Diller tried to open the car door. Rivera resisted. Rivera then shot him in the torso under his bulletproof vest. Diller died at the hospital shortly thereafter. He leaves behind a wife and an infant child. His wife is only 29. I'm not sure how old he was, but, you know, really rough break for them. Man, bummer. Rivera, the criminal, was shot by Diller's partner in the back. He underwent successful surgery and is expected to survive. So you got Trump attending that event. And speaking about the importance of being tougher on crime, then you have Kathy Hochul, who also uh, participated in uh, the events to remember and respect Jonathan Diller. And so the wake was the event that Trump attended on Thursday. The formal funeral, as far as I gather, that was on Friday. So two different events, same guy. But uh, there have been a lot of claims about what actually happened here with Hochul. I've seen everything from she was booted out of the event, that being Diller's funeral, to, oh, no, she was uh, she was received. She was received warmly. She just only could hang around for like 10 minutes. According to The New York Post, she was confronted by a mourner outside the event, and then some applauded as she left, as in they're happy that she's leaving. She made a, a short visit to the event, and the... This uh, unidentified man in black gestured firmly and was visibly agitated as he spoke to Hochul. Onlookers clapped as Hochul went to her car and left. There is some footage um, bear with the wind. We can't really hear what is being said, but we can at least see what it looked like when uh, Hochul was uh, leaving this event. Hmm. 
the New York Post reports that inside the event, Hochul spoke with Dillo, uh, Diller's widow personally, that being uh, 29-year-old Stephanie Diller. A witness tells the Post that it looked like she was telling Hochul off, as in the, the widow. It didn't look like Stephanie had a kind word to say. Hochul left immediately after that. Sources say that Hochul discussed policy, according to this reporting. They just discussed policy while Hochul was there. Um, those discussions with Diller's family, which uh, is another indicator of what was going on here. What what policies would be discussed? Yeah. Maybe repeatedly releasing criminals who repeatedly commit crime, like the guy that took this cop's life. If policy was discussed, that w- w- one would assume in the context of a funeral, it was not praise for her tax plan or something like that. Uh, so it doesn't look like it was a particularly warm welcome for Kathy Hochul at this uh at this event. And speaking of New York City crime, uh well, there's a <laughs> there's a, a woman face punching spree going on specifically in Manhattan. Women are just mysteriously getting punched in the face by unknown attackers. Well, one of them is known. Some actually a couple of them are known, but not all of them are known. Nobody can explain why. Other than it appears these women have made the uh, political calculation that getting punched in the face by a deranged drug addicted hobo <laughs> is just the price that you're you're willing to pay as long as you can uh, continue to kill your children in utero. Fair trade for the modern woman. <laughs> Headline Business Insider yesterday. Women in New York City are getting randomly punched in the face and no one knows why. Several women in New York City have made TikTok videos about getting punched by strangers in public. The NYPD has confirmed some of these incidents. There are some arrests and some charges. Attention to the punching epidemic started on March 25th when 23-year-old TikToker Haley, or Hallie rather, Hallie Kate, posted a viral video about getting punched in her face uh, with... uh, with a large post-punch lump on her forehead. TikTokers have connected Hallie Kate with uh, other area women who have recently suffered the same face-punching fate. One man is now arrested. Uh, Clearly, we've cracked the case. This is all because of Trump supporters. Notice the (laughs) big Trump flag behind this suspect. Yeah, I'm I'm highly suspicious this guy is actually a Trump supporter, but... He is very well, active on social media. I got a clip quickly. I just oh, uh, we'll, I'll play a clip of him and then we'll get to who the hell he is. I was literally just walking and a man came up and punched me in the face. Stories from New York City women going Yikes. viral on TikTok. I literally just got punched by some man on the sidewalk. Their are videos detailing how they're allegedly getting punched in the face completely unprovoked. Several women have posted these videos describing similar allegations in just the last week. Other users posting videos expressing shock, fear, and even sharing tips for staying safe, like not being distracted on your phone while you're out and about. A Skyboki store, he actually is a bit of a fringe political figure, he ran for mayor of New York City back in 2021, and he has now been charged with this assault for one of these cases. It's important to point out Police have not identified him as a suspect in any of the other cases. That's true. There seem to be multiple perpetrators, but this guy's real weird. They all love Trump. That's what ties them together. <laughs> He's big on TikTok. He has 83,000 followers on TikTok. Where but he, he just videos. punches chicks? No, not, not of those. Just like videos of himself at home and in New York doing random stuff. Um, and a lot of it has to do with like interactions that he's having with law enforcement, which are hostile it sounds like um and then he's run for several offices in new york city he claims that he's a descendant of this political activist civil rights activist i'm unfamiliar with marcus garvey but uh it seems that he has made this up like no news organizations have been able to verify it um and he's like he was the leader of a pan africanist movement okay so like some black separatist movement it sounds like but nobody knows why he's punching chicks uh, cause he's a violent black guy. He seems like he has some sort of, there's some sort of mental health issue at play here. Ah. I, or not. I don't know. He seems crazy to me, but maybe everybody else thinks he's totally sane. The, uh, it, maybe it is. I, I mean, I, I, I snicker at mental health because that's usually like the catch all explanation for everything. Uh, mentally ill. 
but in the case of New York or San Francisco or any of these other big places where in addition to refusing to do anything about uh, crime, they also refuse to do anything about legitimately mentally ill bums who in a past generation would have been institutionalized. Maybe that is part of it. I think that the other, um, there's another guy who was arrested. I didn't have time to prep this story. I forgot. So, uh, you know, I, I fire myself for that, but another woman had her jaw broken in a sucker punching incident. And the guy that they got for that, there's another arrest. And he has, according to this report, a history of mental illness as well. And his mugshot definitely looks mentally ill. I don't know what the diagnosis is, but Franz Judy was nabbed after allegedly punching Brooklyn school bus aide Dulce Pichardo in the face as she was walking home from from uh, work in Crown Heights on Tuesday evening. Broke her jaw. You can see her. She's her jaw is wired shut here. She's bruised up. Is there something about being mentally ill that just causes you to punch strangers <laughs> in the face? I just don't. What is it that ties these things together? I. It's such a weird crime. Okay, I'm not even like saying what what causes people to commit crime in general. Punching a stranger in the face for no discernible reason is a very odd it's crime. Bizarre, yeah. So I, I don't I don't know what explains this other than people are roaming the streets who probably shouldn't be roaming the streets by virtue of their criminal records, their mental illness or other things. But it's just like, did all of these mentally ill bums and or criminals get together and form a pact to punch chicks in the face? How did this or is remember the knockout game a few years ago? Yeah, did this they, is exactly the same. Yeah. Did they agree? <laughs> did they did they all get together and do that? I don't know. But. One hilarious piece of the story is, uh, well, we have one New York City councilwoman wondering, where are all the men to defend us? Because women are on edge walking around New York City now. Uh, you know, like that, Maybe the face punching is a new phenomenon, but walking around as a, a, a woman by herself in New York City, I mean, you have experience with that. Mm-hmm. Was it, uh, did you feel comfortable doing that all the time when you were there or did you feel unsafe? Well, I was mostly drunk, so I felt oh. safe. So you were yeah. punching faces, actually. I was, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so b- b- I guess it's I guess clearly it- more dangerous than it was when I lived there, like fifteen years ago. No, crime is down. Haven't you heard? Crime yeah, is down. That's definitely not true. Crime is down. Anyway, women feel unsafe, whether that's the status quo or not. They do, and so you have New York City Councilwoman Amanda Farias tweeting on Thursday. Where are the men calling this out? And she's quote tweeting the Women's Caucus of New York, New York City, expressing concerns about these face punching attacks. And this is a very highly ratioed tweet because, of course, thousands are reminding her of the pending prosecution of Daniel Penny, who, of course, intervened to protect people on the subway from exactly that sort of deranged drug addicted hobo who was threatening to punch them in the face, otherwise known as award winning Michael Jackson impersonator Jordan Neely. When men actually do stand up in the way that she demands, New York prosecutors try to put them in prison. That's the answer to the question. So for this New York City councilwoman, it an unpunched face or racial equity. Those are your two choices, but you can't have both. And you have chosen racial equity. So you get punched in the face. That's the deal. You have to pick one and you made your pick. So live with it. You see that uh, New York City can't even let that uh, bodega worker go. I mean, at least rhetorically, they can't let him go. Do you remember this story, Jose Alba? Oh, yeah, that's right. He worked at one of these shops in New York City. And in 2022, this guy, Austin Simon, comes in with his girlfriend. And there's some dispute about whether Jose Alba, this 60-year-old man behind the counter, who, as you can see, is much smaller in physical stature than Austin Simon. Some dispute about whether Jose Alba should give this guy's girlfriend some chips. And Jose Alba says, no, I will not give you chips. And this Austin Simon fellow says, yes, you will. And there's a dispute. And Austin Simon goes behind the counter and grabs him by the neck, starts physically engaging with him. Jose Alba grabs a a blade, a box cutter. I can't remember what it was. He stabs him several times, kills the guy. And Jose Alba was originally charged by Alvin Bragg with second degree murder. What was the charge? Something like that. 
uh, yeah, second degree murder, put him in Rikers until public backlash was sto- uh, was so strong. By the way, all of this was on video. It's not uh, like you're speculating about what happened. It's all on store surveillance video. Public backlash was so strong that Alvin Bragg just dropped the charges. Well, Alba is now suing Alvin Bragg and the city of New York for wrongful arrest. But as part of that lawsuit defense, New York City lawyers are saying that Alba, quote, went overboard in his self-defense. At least that's quoting the New York Post story. To be fair, I'm not sure if that's exactly what the lawyers said. So just to be clear on what's going on here, this is not New York still trying to prosecute Jose Alba. He's suing them and they're saying, well, hold on. Just because we couldn't put you in prison doesn't mean you didn't go too far in defending yourself at that bodega. What's the statement that they offered here? Um, According, this is New York City's version of events. Quote, Mr. Simon pushed Alba once. So this is the, uh, what was the binger rule in the Britain House trial? He only used one foot. Remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jump kick man, right. like yeah, kicked yeah. him in the head and bingers rule. He only used one foot as though you can kick a guy in the head and that's not called uh, potentially lethal force. So Simon just pushed Alba once. That's all. And he grabbed him by the collar to escort him outside for the for the expressed purpose of having him apologize to his girlfriend. The New York City <laughs> lawyers said, while the district attorney's office found it would be difficult to disprove justification beyond a reasonable doubt, it was not unreasonable to arrest the plaintiff in the first place. OK, I don't know all the legalities of whether you can sue for wrongful arrest and all that. And anytime someone dies, sometimes arrests are made. So, I I mean, the guy went to Rikers, too. They didn't just arrest him and question him. They took him to jail for a while. But that's the nature of the lawsuit. But just think of the standards that they're advocating here. Um, If you run a shop in New York City, you're a business person. Someone comes into your store threateningly. They, They go behind the counter threateningly this did not happen on the store floor this happened behind the counter grab you physically threateningly it is still on you to assume well this man just wants a polite conversation outside no i'm going to assume he wants to curb stomp me like american history x and i'm going to stab him if he tries that that's what any reasonable person would do but (laughs) it's going to be a polite beating on the street and that that's all I, i Once again, speaking of just things I can't believe anyone actually believes when they say it. Look, this is a still frame. You can go watch the whole video. I I can't play it on YouTube. When I made a video about this topic two years ago, it was a nightmare to even get it to play on YouTube because YouTube doesn't want you to be able to see the scene. It is violent in fairness. So I can't play the video. I'm not trying to hide it. But does this look like a guy? who is escorting an old man outside for a polite conversation about the need for an apology (laughs) to his girlfriend. Listen, there's been a misunderstanding, sir. Yeah, really? My already obese girlfriend would like a bag of potato chips. And by the way, in that video, that girlfriend, forget exactly what she did, but if my memory serves, she committed an assault on Jose Alba as well. She was attacking him too. And she was never charged. She was never, uh, there was never any, any, punishment brought toward her even though she was part of this attack on him what do they expect to happen in new york don't run a business yeah i mean obviously what are they going to do it's going to end up like Times square in the 70s uh yeah i suppose so but uh at least their bridges are still up you know for now man the story other uh major news of the week besides you know diddy doing his best epstein impression was the cargo ship in Baltimore crashing into and collapsing the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which is a perfect metaphor for the state of the country. The author of The Star-Spangled Banner, that's over, that is that is collapsed. The bridge will be promptly rebuilt as George Floyd Bridge, and it will collapse shortly thereafter because of faulty DEI engineering. But you can't say that. DEI is code for the N-word, which <laughs> we'll get to with the mayor in just a moment. But as far as what's going on with the um, investigation and the repair plan, uh, crews over the weekend worked on removing the first portion of that wreckage. The first priority for them is opening up a channel to get more vessels into the water around the collapse site. 
They have to cut these bridge trusses into pieces to remove them with these giant cranes. There's no timeline for reopening the channel or rebuilding the bridge, according to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, or Pete Buttplug, if you would prefer to call him that. Wreckage extends 50 feet deep into the water, which is apparently very murky. Visibility is a challenge. Uh, In all likelihood, we're looking at years to rebuild this. The bridge took five years to build last time, says Secretary Budplug. But uh, it may not take as long this time since not all of the bridge is collapsed. Some of it may be usable. Uh, And if you don't uh, if you don't trust his assessment of the engineering, remember, he's gay. And that's what's important. (laughs) I'm not um, I'm not really tinfoily about this incident. I don't know about you. Do you do you are you thinking there was like uh, some kind of secret op going on here or do you just buy it as an accident? No, it seems like general minority incompetence. I think. Well, we we don't who's actually responsible. Is it like the Indians who are running the ship or I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. Okay. I don't know. Probably. Well, yeah. plot twist for you. It was a white guy who's responsible. I can't. He's, he's, you're going to have to eat your words. Never. All right. Um, I, personally, I'm not very tinfoily about the incident. Uh, sometimes accidents happen, of course. I, I think if this was an intentional attack, I'd be inclined to believe that it would have happened at a time other than 1.30 in the morning with you know, more traffic, more damage. Uh, but there is one piece of the puzzle that I find interesting. There are about two minutes of missing data from the ship's voyage data recorder or VDR, the equivalent of a, a black box in a plane. This happens, though, sometimes, doesn't it, it? It does. I'm not saying, oh, this is for sure a big, uh, you know, this is evidence of uh, uh, you know, something crazy and uh, intentional plot. I just, I, if, if nothing else, I think the design being this way is interesting. But here's what officials had to say about two minutes of missing data from right before the crash. At 0, 0124 and 59 seconds, numerous audible alarms were recorded on the ship's audio, bridge audio. About the same time, VDR sensor data ceased recording. However, the VDR audio continued to record using the redundant power source. At around 0126 and two seconds, the VDR resumed recording sensor data. And during this time, there were steering commands and rudder orders recorded on the audio. Okay. So as you were saying, that explanation is not um, necessarily unusual. Um. It, it, because the ship experienced some sort of power failure in such a power failure, that VDR would record only audio and not instrument data. And that's what happened. So perhaps that's not weird. I'm not saying that it is necessarily given the design. I just wonder why would the system be designed that way to record only audio on backup power? And maybe there right. is a reason for that, that an engineer could explain to me. But when you have a major failure like this one, that's exactly when you want data not when you should lose data and the data lost would be things about the way the ship was traveling. So the speed, the direction, uh, steering commands, rudder input, all the stuff about how the ship is being maneuvered and how it's moving, which of course in the couple minutes before it actually crashes into the bridge, very relevant to the analysis. Uh, And it's, it's not um, just to be clear about the timeline too. the data were lost, not necessarily right leading up to the impact just before 1 25 AM, the ship's VDR stopped recording due to the power issues. It resumed recording at 1 26 and then the ship crashed into the bridge at 1 29. So there is a, there's about a two minute gap, but the recorder did resume recording data before the crash. So it okay. wasn't like data lost then crash and we have nothing in the interim. There was a gap right before the crash, but some data uh, recorded before the crash. Again, I'm just curious why the system would be designed that way. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Why would you have backup power to record voice only, but not backup power to record ship movement data? Right, 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 yeah. I don't get that. Uh, We were discussing this, but uh, it does appear several of the, well, at least one, but piecing it together. There are six deaths. I think, uh, what is it? Two people were rescued from the water Six deaths or presumed deaths. No, sorry. Four are missing and presumed dead. Another two were rescued. But you got guys from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico. Yeah. 
Uh, the Washington Post confirms, speaking to the family of one of the guys, at least one of them was an illegal immigrant. And uh, I, I, the narrative I've seen spun out of that, well, look, they're doing the jobs that no one wants to do, and now they've lost their life. They came here. How many unemployed people do we have in this country? This isn't like that bad of a job. It's not like sewage scoping or what, you know, this isn't like the worst job in America. Filling potholes is what they were doing, as far as I understand. Yeah, the, the, I, I find it really hard to believe that there's no American that can't or won't do this job. What a bullshit excuse. Well, and then, I know that more than one of them is illegal. At least one is and piecing it together, you can bet probably more are. Uh, but that's just, uh, you know, a, a sub piece of the story. Uh, the other controversy that has emerged from the event is the alleged racism against Baltimore's mayor, Brandon Scott who, according to the Washington Post, endured racist attacks as the result of the bridge collapse. After he appeared at press conferences and in TV interviews this week, people called him a DEI mayor. Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) Who the hell did that? According to the Washington Post, uh, one user on X called him Baltimore's DEI mayor. Oh, did they? Who's that? We're not going to tell you. One user on X. Oh, okay. Another one said, he looks like your average street criminal. Who's that? Oh, it's another X user. Neither responded to our request for comment. Okay. So like randos tweeted that this guy is potentially unqualified to be mayor. And we're going to pretend like he is. Maybe they are racist. Okay. Like, let's say these tweeters are just straight up racist. Yeah. Oh no. The horror. A guy in general tweeted (laughs) (laughs) like, in the context of your city falling apart, people dying, the economy in your city being interrupted for potentially years, traffic patterns through your city totally destroyed. Well, someone tweeted that that I'm an N, but they used coded language for the N. That's the, the scandal that he's facing. And because he had to endure the racism of Twitter randos calling him a diversity hire, the mayor went on Joy Reid's show to discuss what's really important, how it's his life's purpose to make racist white people afraid. Mayor Scott, if you choose to do so, to respond to the tomfoolery uh, and attacks on you for having the nerve to be black and also a mayor. I know, and we all know, and you know very well, that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only uh, uh, Straight, wealthy, white men should have a saying anything. We've been the boogeyman from them since the first day they brought us to this country. And what they mean by DI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, we know what they want to say, uh, but they don't have the courage to say the N-word. And the fact that I don't uh, believe in their uh, untruthful and wrong ideology, and I am very proud of, proud of my heritage and who I am and where I come from, scares them uh, because me being at my position means that their way of thinking, their way of life of being comfortable and suffering and while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk and they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life. No, good Lord. <laughs> is there anybody more delusional than the black person with like a 95 IQ? Like the self-confidence. I haven't seen his test results. I absolutely incredible. Um, I mean, I think we can all agree that slavery was a mistake, right? <laughs> I mean, why why would yes i would agree why was it a mistake I and mean, we're paying for it aren't we <laughs> i would say there are moral problems for its own sake but i get, yeah 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 i get that, your bit too. yeah yeah it's just ugh, fine whatever this whole thing of like black people are killing each other in record numbers let's talk about the black abortion rate but like white people are clearly the problem here or it's all just a it's a boogeyman that is made up you know and it's like Dude, I don't even have to say that with like the fear of you that you're alleging. Oh, no, it's a black guy. Not that you should say that with respect to the to the community you're claiming to represent there. If you're talking about what the real problems are that are faced, it's exactly what you're talking about. It is young black men murdering other young black men. This is not a white fear problem. This is a very real problem that is ravaging your city right now. And for you to act like the only problem is rich white people from far away hillsides looking down upon your city. No, they could uh, they they could turn their backs on that city entirely, never enter that city again, never concern themselves with that city. There are major problems that need to be fixed. It has nothing to do with whether someone tweeted 
a, a racist tweet about you or something like that. And on his point, you know, I'm not a DEI mayor is really what he's saying there. I actually do to that theme. I, I take that point. You're not a diversity hire mayor because Baltimore is 60% black. You represent the majority there. By definition, you are not a diversity hire in that context. But in that context, why would your life's purpose be to make racist white people afraid? As though in a majority black city with all the problems that Baltimore has, the real problem is racist white people who mostly don't live there. How? Yeah. That's your life's purpose? All the problem. It's not, it's not saving the lives of black people who are victimized in your city. Your life's, your life's purpose is making racist whites afraid of you. Which is weird because at the in the same sentence he's saying it's a big problem that white people are racist and afraid of me. Also, my mission is to make racist white people afraid of me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you can't win. I notice you can't win. How's that bridge going though? Uh, you gonna fix that? You gonna worry about that? Or are the tweets gonna be too distracting? Yeah. And it, I hate to tell you, if you're a politician, public figure like this, but especially a politician, person who works on behalf of the people, you're going to have to take some heat on the Internet. That's just part of the job. People are going to say mean, thing, mean things about you, maybe even racist things about you. But it's your job to focus on on your job. And your job is not scaring racist white people. It's it's getting results for the people who elect you. But yep, exactly. I guess they I guess they. Maybe his constituents vote for him for that reason. I voted for him because he's going to scare racist white people. That's what. <laughs> that's why he earned my vote. All right. Sticking with the theme, are you ready for hoax hate? Oh, I'm so. I was born ready. Okay. And now the nobody saw it happen, but it's totally a product of Trump's America hoax hate crime of the week. Ah, shit, it's backwards. You think they'll notice? I received several emails this week. Do you have an alibi for this event? Well, you mentioned at the top, you actually claimed responsibility for it. I did, but- no one cares. No, unfortunately, this was not me. I was like, who is this person that did this? This sounds awesome. Actually, initially, when I heard about this, I was like, I think this is true. But it turned out to uh, not be. So Utah, this was a Utah basketball. It was it was Spokane. They were supposed to go to Spokane. It was. Um, hold on. I have it in my notes. What is it? I was going to say NAACP. It's, the, it's NCAA the, tournament. That's it's it the March Madness college basketball tournament. Yeah. Yes, um, the, the Utah team. They were sent to Spokane, but they ended up staying in Coeur d'Alene. They were all pissed off that they had to stay in Coeur d'Alene because it's 35 minutes away from Spokane. Some of us so might like, call that an upgrade, by the way, Coeur d'Alene to Spokane. For sure. Spokane is yeah. such a shithole. Um, but I think they were mad about it. Like yeah. What they said about this was um, we were actually taken aback by our accommodations because when we were planning to host, we were having similar issues. We were seeking hotels in Provo, Park City, or Ogden. The NCAA said no to that. So the fact that we were sent to a place that wasn't even the state that the university is hosting resides in was inc- incredibly problematic. Well, what does the state have to do with it? It's right across the state line. They were just mad that it wasn't in in the state and they were going to have to travel. So yes. like they came pissed off. I think that they colluded to do this, you know, ahead of time. Anyway, so these girls, they were walking past this restaurant right by my house, crafted. Um, and they said that some guy in a white truck with a Confederate flag was like, get out of here and words and they were all in shock there's video footage of them going into crafted and they're all yelling and then they said this is how i know it's not true because the first part i'm like maybe that might that might kind of what i I thought from to the emailers i said 99 percent chance fake but if real north idaho would be the place it would be the place Yeah. yeah um I mean, I wish it was more racist here, but it's it's not, unfortunately. It's really gone it's, downhill. It, it's Ever gone since, downhill. Uh, yeah. Ruby Ridge, and you know, yeah, yeah. really. Uh, look what happened in the neighborhood. Um, so then they said that they they ate and everything like that, and that this guy got his buddies, and then they came back, and that when they were leaving the restaurant, that they drove by again, they were like, "For real, get out of here, <laughs> Kanigas." Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then they were talking about how it how it made them feel. I got emotional. I started to cry. I'll never forget the sound I of that word, the intimidation of the noise that came from the engine, the N word. 
I go to bed and I hear it every night since I've been here. I couldn't imagine well, us having to stay there. They count N words to sleep. It's not sheep jumping over them. It's ends that they it's, count yeah. as they go by. Oh my it's God. It's like, come on. When I, I thought maybe, I thought maybe. And then I heard that they, like they had come back with more people. Like, what were these people doing? They were just like sitting on sixth street waiting for them to come out of this restaurant for like an hour. The races oh around here. They're really busy. They've got better things to do. The only way I could conceptualize this as real, and I got some clips as well, because there's the 911 call that has come out, and there's the commentary from the Utah coach. The only way I thought this might be real, because they're talking about, what I understand is I've, I've heard two separate accounts of this, and they're in these news stories. But account one is really uh, that that you had these women's basketball players who were clearly targeted by this racist guy in a truck saying you women's basketball player N words. I do not like you. Yeah. Then other accounts I've read are more like, well, there were these guys like racing down the street and driving aggressively interacting with each other. And we heard an N word. Yeah. So it's like, well, what are we we talking about? Young men doing some kind of street race and one of them said the N word to the other, or did he say, Hey, I don't like women's basketball player N words in my town. No, I don't think and, this happened at all. I think they were pissed off for other reasons. They looked up Coeur d'Alene. They were like, Oh, it has this history of being racist back when it was awesome. <laughs> and then they devised this entire story. I don't think any of this shit happened. You know, somebody put out a $10,000 reward for any evidence or a witness and nothing has happened. And this happened, you know, you know, Coeur d'Alene. So the area in which this allegedly happened, I assume right downtown, cameras, main, main lots street, of people. Yeah. yeah. This is not some hidden place or something. No. Okay. So we also have the 911 call and this came from some, I don't know who, who he is and they've, at least in some of this video footage, they've concealed his identity. But he is somebody who's with the Utah basketball team and is some kind of fundraiser for them or something. But what's weird is even in his allegation in the 911 call, he says something like a hate crime just happened. I, I forget his exact phrasing, but he doesn't go as far as to say that they were uh, criminally victimized. Right. Put what I'm reporting as almost a hate Almost a hate crime. Almost a hate crime. The party of a hunter was walking to one of your restaurants, and two cars that were racing up and down your street made it a point to start yelling F and N, and I'll just use the N, just you can figure that out, and continued to race up and down your main street on the way to the pub with a hundred guests from the NCAA, and we left. We went out after, and guess what? Here's three more cars racing down your main street and guess what they did f and n f and n when the chaperones with the team spoke to police later that night we blurred out his face to protect his privacy so we're here they're going to be around we have other things scheduled contacted the ncaa Mm -hmm. who's the governing body and you know what they i mean they moved i mean get us out of here and isn't that kind of revealing to your point that they didn't want to go to Coeur d'Alene in the first place because it was inconvenient? And wow, the results are, hey, NCAA, get us out of here. And my understanding is they did. They moved them right out of town. They Magical. Sure did. You also had the uh, the Utah coach saying that this was a hate crime. We had uh, several instances of um, some kind of racial... Uh, hate crimes. Now it's several uh, instances towards our too. program. Like there's so much diversity in, in, in a, on a college campus, and so you're just not exposed to that very often. Racism is real for our players and and staff to not feel safe in an NCAA tournament environment. Um, it's messed up. Uh huh. It's messed up. So that's it. Uh, And as far as I haven't had a lot of time to read about this story, but as far as you've seen, nobody's produced any substantiating evidence. I love that they released Mm -hmm. the footage of here are the players walking around town and some of them look kind of mad or something as though that's evidence of anything. Of course. I mean, yeah, this this did not this did not happen. Hmm. Well, if it if we have to do a correction on that because evidence comes out, I have a feeling you'll be happy about that particular correction. (laughs) You get out. You never bring your basketball back here again. You basketball American. <laughs> All right. It. 
uh, update in, it's not the original hoax hate crime, but of course it's um, perhaps the most famous. The saga of Jossie Smollett is still not over. I don't know. For some reason, I thought in my mind it was, but he has a, he has not exhausted all of his appeals. Of course, Jossie Smollett faked his infamous hate crime over five years ago now in January 2019. February 2019, grand jury indicted him on a felony count of lying to police. March 2019, Cook County attorney Kim Fox dropped the charge against him. June 2019, state assigned a special prosecutor to the case. February 2020, Jussie was indicted again for lying to police. Trial began in November 2021. He was convicted in December 2021. He yelled at everyone saying he's not suicidal. He was sentenced to 150 days in jail. He served six days in jail. That was March 22, March 2022. And he was then released after six days pending appeal. Well, in December last year, the appeals court upheld his conviction. Jussie appealed to what is probably his last legal option, the Illinois Supreme Court, unless the U.S. Supreme Court takes his case, which would be hilarious, but I doubt it. The Illinois Supreme Court has now agreed to hear Jussie's appeal, though. As far as the content of the appeal, uh, of the appeal, Jesse is no longer claiming in legal documents that he's innocent of faking the hate crime. This is an argument, an argument about process and constitutional rights and the constitutional right against double jeopardy. He says that at least the spirit of his constitutional right against double jeopardy is being violated. When Jesse's charges were dropped the first time, he forfeited his bond and he performed some community service, which if this report is correct, he like went to a high school and talked to them about social media for a half hour. And that's Mm -hmm. his community service. He says that the the second set of charges, so Kim Fox brings charges, Jesse then uh, gets the charges dropped in exchange for forfeiture of his bond. Then there's a second, uh, there's a special prosecutor who brings the charges on which he was convicted. And he's saying that second set of charges violated his agreement with Kim Fox to drop the charges in exchange for that bond forfeiture, thus the double jeopardy, thus the legal problem. I don't know Illinois case law on this matter. On paper, I would doubt that he's going to succeed based on the fact that the first charges were never brought to trial. There really isn't legal jeopardy regarding those charges. Generally, at least as far as I understand, not a lawyer's opinion, but at least as far as I understand, legal jeopardy is usually defined as the commencement of prosecution. That didn't happen with those first charges. The simple filing of charges, as far as I understand, generally not considered legal jeopardy. Indeed, prosecutors adjust charges ahead of trial all the time. Sometimes the court even makes them adjust charges ahead of time. So unclear how exactly the Illinois Supreme Court will hear, or uh, when they'll, they'll hear the case, rather. At least I haven't seen any date. Uh... But as we talk about every time, there's an update in the Jussie story. He could have just served the jail time. He could yeah. have been out for years just by shut now. Up, dude, just just do it. He could have been he could have revived his career by going back to the Osin Dairo brothers and making a funny video like they make, making fun of himself, and he probably would have had some sort of redemption arc. You know, instead he's lost five because plus this years. was so embarrassing for him that if he had he had treated it with more levity, I think we all would have been like, ah, oh, we forgive you. Yeah, well, it'd be better than this. Yeah. Five plus years of his life. He got a 150 day sentence, half a year sentence. It's now consumed five plus years of his life. And in all likelihood, he's still going to have to serve the half year sentence. So yeah. there's going to be nothing gained out of this. All misery, all pain. But that's uh, that's what he has chosen. You mentioned um, next Benedict. And this, of course, ah. is the uh, the transgender high schooler or the non-binary high schooler who died in Oklahoma. We later found it was a drug overdose. It was alleged to be anti-trans bullying. Well, now there's some reporting that comes out about what is really behind the disturbance of this individual. Yes. On, in 2019, when she was 11, an arrest warrant was issued for her father, her biological father. He was arrested in, uh, also in 2019 for the charge of rape of a minor under the age of 14 during the period of 2017, uh, May 2017 and August 2017 when she was nine years old and among the witnesses was uh, her grandmother who ended up adopting her. Um, He ended up pleading that down to sexual assault in the second degree. He was sentenced to five years in prison with 10 suspended and on the sex offender registry, no contact with his daughter. But then he was arrested again for failing to comply with reporting as a sex offender. And this was two weeks before she committed suicide. 
So in the report, and it's horrifying, I would not read it, but she told investigators when she was 11, she told them when she was 11, um, that her father anally raped her was starting when she was nine. And then he had molested her for like years before that. So I think that the situation here, and we have to consider this with a lot of transgender people, especially female to male transgenders, that they're being sexually abused and they want to abandon all parts of them that can be viewed as feminine or um, as sexual to men or appealing to men. And I think that that's the situation with her. Can you imagine anally raped as a child of your own father? Well, and, and this is, that's the thing about transgender day of visibility. I mean, I agree that, that the visibility should be there in so far as it is, it is often a symptom of victimization in this case. Look at um, Ellen Page or Elliot Page now too. Probably very similar set of circumstances. Sexually abused, sexually assaulted, becomes a man as a defense mechanism, as a response yeah. to that sort of behavior, as, as a response to the degeneracy in Hollywood. I don't know for sure, but that's you know what's, what's speculated. But yeah, I mean, the problem with trans day of visibility is we're supposed to we're supposed to act like one has nothing to do with the other. Exactly. That yeah. This next Benedict was just no, they, she was just a normal non-binary kid who happened to be anally raped. Yeah. One didn't cause like the totally other. Totally unrelated. Yeah. And we're going to we're going to promote people entering this lifestyle as though it's healthy. I mean, that that's the problem. It's like. People want to act like transphobia is based on a hatred of people or something. No, it's um, it's actually based on an opposition to suffering. And I noticed that transgender people disproportionately suffer. And I would like people not to suffer, which is why I think transgenderism should be discouraged. It's nothing to do with hate. It has everything to do with preventing this sort of outcome. Man, it's just so sad. So sad. This is just the worst. Well, I feel bad for everybody involved except for, of course, her father. How about I try to relax you with some surprise cringe? (sighs) This clip is very uh, brief and perhaps confusing. You may have seen it this week, but tell me if you know what this is or can identify what this is. What? Hold on. It didn't play for me. Oh, yeah. This is Taylor Lorenz. I saw this for 40 times. One more more time. Had to cut it down for the copyrighted music. But yeah, you know exactly what that is. Yeah. Taylor Lorenz doing what? Uh, Dancing at, wait, don't tell me. Was it her 40th birthday? Was it? Oh, no, no, no. Do you need to see the background once more? It was at some tranny thing? Yeah, show me that. All right. I know I I saw. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was this porn hub party. Yeah. That is Taylor Lorenz dancing with a mask at a at the recent Pornhub Awards. It is 2024. Who the fuck is still wearing a mask right now? No, she's immunocompromised. That's why. Why? Uh, as the uh, mostly peaceful memes account posted, she still wears a mask four years later, but goes to a literal gathering of venereal disease. Yeah. Uh so Taylor Lorenz, this is the sixth annual Pornhub Awards that Taylor Lorenz goes to. Taylor Lorenz, of course, uh, the um, the tech and internet culture reporter at the Washington Post. No word on if Taylor Lorenz plans on pursuing an award with this mask on, or if she was there as a performer, or what the hell she was doing there. I don't get it because she does she report on porn for the Washington Post, not as far as I've seen. So is she there? What the hell for- is she doing there? It, it just personal reasons. Is she there for, prof- I don't understand why she's there and I've not seen an explanation. Maybe she's done a porn and we just haven't seen it. Well, uh, for those of you who may have mask kink, uh, look out for Taylor Lorenz's <laughs> who may enjoy mask kink or wh- whatever. Taylor Lorenz is considering a new career path or, or something like that. Uh, all right. Anything else before we hop into the movie review? No, let's do it. Let's get into it. In a world of movie references flying over his head, one man will finally watch them. This is the Matt and Blonde Show Movie Review. 
This week's movie is the 2004 Mel Gibson epic The Passion of the Christ, in which the Son of God is betrayed and arrested for his blasphemy, then beaten, crucified, and resurrected in perhaps the most famous story ever told. No movie picker commentary this week. Uh, the Passion, of course, is a, a an Easter and Tranny Day special by audience suggestion. But we do have the face swap art. And uh, this is what we were talking about earlier. Will we get, how much trouble will we get in this for that? And, oh, I hate this. <laughs> if you think that blonde, at, it's not blonde as Jesus, it's blonde as Jim Caviezel as Jesus. That's that's what it is. Um, if you think that that the is. The Satan one let, makes me feel way less uncomfortable. If that's distasteful, then there she is deserving to be Satan. <laughs> And I'm one of Satan's demon children with a handlebar mustache for some reason. Why? Why did the AI give me a weird <laughs> mustache? I don't know. Whatever. Um, oh, and then, of course, we have the the video. Oh, man. The video face swap. Uh, let me grab that. Until Maha Amanimbi. Uh, for those of you who listen to the show and you can't see the video, that is Jesus, me as Jim Caviezel, as Jesus, informing his disciples that they must choose between Candace and Ben, which is a difficult choice. I don't think that's a very difficult choice, actually. But, oh, boy. Uh, oh, as, boy. As always, your review and your rating. Well... I, you know, I should reveal my biases first. Yeah, this is uh, practically porn for you. Speaking of. Well, I love Mel Gibson and Jesus. I love Jesus <laughs> Got everything. Mel Gibson, of course. Yeah. Um, and I, what I'd else seen this... does it have? Go on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that wasn't a rhetorical question. Oh, I just, I just mean um, there's like some people are portrayed unkindly and the ADL doesn't like it, but I'm oh, going right, yeah. to get into that in, in my portion. I didn't even mention that in my review. Really? All right. We should have, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean um, to uh, to sway it. The idea that this movie is flagrantly anti-Semitic is such a preposterous claim that I failed to even address it because, you know, it's historically accurate. Uh, this movie was a masterpiece. I remember seeing it in 2004. And around that time, there was all of this hubbub Did I just accidentally say a racial slur? Like, <laughs> like I think that you one mean hullabaloo, right? Hullabaloo? Or, or jigaboo. Jigaboo is what I meant. Yeah. Um, there's all this jigaboo about uh, how incredibly violent it was, how it was excessively violent. And it was the most violent movie ever made or whatever. I'm like, and I, and I remember thinking like, this is, propaganda to to say that because this this is actually the, the life of jesus christ this is what people did to him this is what jews did to jesus christ um and i remember watching it and being like it was the this, romans this, yeah whatever uh the, the the exact reaction i had this time was that it showed enough of the violence uh for the viewer to be like to to really feel what what he went through for our salvation and i thought that was so essential and so central to the movie and i and i loved that it was just told exactly as it happened every drop of blood and i thought that that really needed to be seen the pain really needed to be seen um something that i took away from this viewing that i did not from my last viewing, which was 20 years ago was um this sympathy that i had for people that were denying jesus and i i it wasn't part of my um religious experience and and it doesn't really translate when you're reading the bible but um during this when when you're watching his apostles uh betray him and 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 judas you don't realize that um there was there was immediate regret and that um in the case was it peter the apostle peter peter bales he denies uh, jesus yeah. uh jesus says you're going to deny me three times but, before the morning right, right, or whatever but and, you yeah. don't um you don't realize it in the context of the bible that he was going to get ripped apart like limb for limb by an angry mob. And so I really appreciated that, that the showing all of that pressure, like the, the pressure that people had the human pressure to save, to save yourself from just incredible pain, a, a painful death um, was the impetus for their betrayal. And I think that's a really important part of the story too, as well. Um, cinematography was excellent. The casting was perfect uh what what is his name jim caviezel 
Caviezel. That's the that's Family right. Guy joke when they do the Passion of the Christ 2 thing. Jim Cav- 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 Caviezel? Is that it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's the guy from The Count of Monte Cristo. Perfectly. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. That guy. Um, it was just as concise as it needed to be. It was just fantastic. I, I just... I just love Mel. Uh, five out of five for me. Five. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I like you, I saw it when it came out 20 years ago and I saw it as a, an idiot high school kid in uh, my really? small town theater. Yeah. But I watched it with a completely different mindset. I watched it like, let's see what this religious propaganda is all about. Yuck, yuck, yuck. But that's not the way I view it now. Uh, for reasons we discuss all the time. But as far as things I liked, um, I'm going to, I do think that it is it is uh, a, a beat down in the second half. And I'm not saying that oh, it yeah. is that that's it was rough. Yeah, I'm saying it's hard to watch. I'm not saying that it's uh, wrong necessarily. But one thing I appreciated is that it's it it does have a lot of philosophical value uh, even before the beat down and even mixed into the beat down when they're having flashbacks to uh, Jesus's conversations and teachings with his apostles. But there's a lot of um. It, it's not a, a philosophically heavy movie or at least as philosophically heavy as it could be because it spends so much time right. on the suffering itself. But the phil- the philosophy it hits, I thought was, was pretty well presented and it had me thinking. And um, I liked the presentation of Jesus's arrest and uh, when Peter slashes uh, the dude's ear and, and, and Jesus stops him and you know, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. And I, I'm familiar with that phrase and i haven't thought about it much in the biblical context it's from matthew's gospel we haven't discussed that in the bible study yet so i haven't i haven't thought about that in the biblical context but you think about that phrase like live by the sword die by the sword in a simple term in simple terms it it often comes off as like pure pacifist um you should never engage in violence even in self-defense type situations sometimes uh and and i just I, i look forward to discussing with our Bible study leader, my Bible study leader, because he knows a lot about how this scripture is supposed to be interpreted. What was, what was Jesus's philosophy on that? And what was the intent? Because I have a hard time believing that it's as simple as like the sword has no, has no purpose or has no value. Um, Those who live by the sword die by the sword to me implied in that is some sort of choice in the application of the sword. Not that it can never be applied, but that there's choice in the matter. The idea being that it's wise to avoid violence whenever there's a choice. Be smart and morally restrained with your violence. I, I'm I'm just wondering what the what the proper interpretation of that philosophy is. I thought it was interesting in this presentation. Uh, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. And that's Jesus talking to his apostles uh, in a flashback in this movie as he's washing their feet. That's a reference from from the Gospel of John. And we did discuss that passage in uh, one particular session of the Bible study that I linked. And I gather that in context, Jesus is, of course, talking about his disciples specifically. And he's preparing them for the persecution they may or will face for following him. But there's kind of there's there's broader wisdom in that, too. Um, And the idea is no matter how significant your struggles may get, no matter how much it seems like the world hates you, you are not the first to be hated by this world. You are likely not unique in that regard. And there is always a moral obligation to persevere through them. In this context, just as Jesus persevered through that anguish. So I thought that was a cool moment. Um, there's, I think there's a big theme about the risk of prioritizing money. Now, I'll take your point on Judas. Judas, his, his, sub story, his subplot, I think, is one of the best part of this movie, uh, best parts of this movie. Because you see him regretting his decision to betray Jesus. You see him Mm -hmm. tormented by these demons. And ultimately he takes his own life. And he doesn't even see the conclusion of Jesus' story. Uh, But I... So in that, like maybe there's sympathy in the regret. But I, I, I take his motive in this presentation to be money. I don't take it to be like fear of uh, punishment for him. You know, he, he betrays him for the, the 30 silver coins or whatever it is. And I think there's a big theme about be careful about prioritizing money. Um, yeah. You know, money is necessary to do great things, to build a family, to provide security, to do all the sorts, all sorts of stuff you need to do in life. But money without fundamental moral principle guiding it becomes evil. And that that's what happened with Judas, at least in this presentation. 
There's some debate, of course, about why Judas betrayed Jesus or some competing reasons. So I'm not saying it's purely what? that, but I, I was under the impression that it was purely for financial. Yeah. I was reading some stuff about other reasons he may have done it. Uh, and I'm certainly not a, uh, a scriptural expert to tell you with certainty, but, um, but I, I, I really love that sub story. Judas, I thought was uh, his story in this movie. I thought was great. It does stay mostly true to the scripture. I was trying to read critical pieces about, oh, here's how it deviated from the Gospels. And there are some creative liberties, like the, sn- the Satan snake in the garden. Um, you have the chil- the demon children taunting Judas. A lot I of that stuff that, is yeah. a lot of that stuff is kind of like creative liberty. It's not necessarily straight from scripture. But as far as the sequence of event of, of events, like Jesus did A, B, and then C. Yeah, that's largely based on the scripture. I've not seen a lot of criticism saying, no, nothing like that happened in the Gospels. This is made up. It didn't happen that way. It's true to its source material, and I respect that. I Personally, I, I, I'm actually kind of surprised that you didn't dabble in this point, but I love that the ADL hates it. Like That's that yeah. is, is almost an automatic five wiki for me on that <laughs> basis alone. I was reading what the ADL had to say. They still have several pages on their website devoted to hating this movie. They have a a review of the movie at the time of its release in 2004, in which the authors described their feelings of anger, disappointment, and pain after seeing it. And they warned that it may not cause is the pronunciation pogroms. I always forget how to pronounce that word. It's not, it's not going to cause Holocaust too, but there's, they're still worried. It's really going to get people hating the Jews. That was the ADL's concern. They had a Q&A from 2013. The ADL bemoans that Mel Gibson presented the Jewish high priests as bloodthirsty. But simultaneously they, they offered... They were. What? Well, they, they offered no explanation in this piece about how Gibson's presentation was not accurate to the Gospels. The, the ADL was so wildly biased against this movie, they pre-condemned it. They issued a statement in June 2003, more than half a year before the movie was even released. The ADL called the script anti-Semitic, and I'll remind you that much of the script is, if not directly lifted from the scripture, a very close paraphrasing. They issued their recommendations to fix it. All of this controversy, of course, because of the fear that that viewers will conclude the Jews killed Jesus itself an anti-Semitic myth, according to the ADL. But the movie follows the gospel events. Jewish high priests tried and convicted Jesus, brought him to the Romans for execution. Yes, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, hesitated to do it. He found Jesus not guilty. But he ultimately agreed to execute him to appease the mob, exactly as Mel presents. And to recognize that account in the Gospels is not to blame all Jews or today's Jews for that act. To me, it's like, oh, I watched Mel Gibson in The Patriot. And because I recognize the role that the British crown had in the American revolution, does that mean that I, it's anti limeism That's what it is. Do I hate British people today because of what King George did back then? It doesn't make any sense. You can recognize historical truth and not conclude. Like, the ADL doesn't trust you with that partic- that piece of historical fact, at least as the gospels characterize it. Because you can't be trusted not to hate a Jewish guy today on the basis of knowing that. I can't know the truth about British abuses of the colonials because I might hate the royal family today. And Kate has cancer. She can't withstand that, you know? That's not true. She faked faked the cancer. Have you heard that song? (laughs) Just like those photos. Anyway, just... uh, Anybody who wants to hide information from you and prevent you from deciding for yourself in that way... That is an enemy. And I didn't choose that ADL. You chose that. But maybe they've changed their opinion on this movie since it came out 20 years ago. All right. The only thing I don't like, uh, and I don't even, to say I don't like is maybe overstating it. It's just not a family-friendly presentation. When I'm watching it, I'm thinking of that um, famous Simpsons moment. You know, stop, stop. He's already dead when he's beating up the Hamburglar guy. Except in this case, he isn't, or he is very briefly. But, uh. Then we have the resurrection story, of course. But the latter half of the movie is just pure brutality. And we have a few flashbacks into key moments in in Jesus' teaching. I mean, he gets whipped. He gets beaten. He gets thorn crowned. He has to drag the heavy cross all across town up the big hill. 
He gets his hands and his feet nailed. He he gets cross flipped. Man, when they flip him over and he got the blood just like draining off of him. And he's up there for a long time. You got the raven pecking out the other guy's eye until he finally dies. And all of these scenes are are very bloody gory. They're just physically painful to watch. And it's all of that is over an hour in time. And and I I, I get it. Like you're saying, that is the point. The point is that Jesus suffered unimaginably to pay for your sins and to understand the significance of that sacrifice. It should be torturous viewing. So I'm not saying that those graphically brutal scenes make no sense. I'm just saying it does come with a trade-off. Yeah. If one day I want to introduce my sons to the, the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, the passion is just not an option, at least while they're young. And I presume Mel would say, well, yeah, it's not an intended, it's not intended to be an entry point for your kids like that. In the same way, Mm -hmm. saving private Ryan is very, very gory. It's not intended to teach third graders about the history of world war two. Uh, so fair point. I mean, I, I get what he's going for. And, uh, I mean, the story as told is not exactly family friendly in that way either. So, you know, I, I understand. Uh, but because I just, I, there's understanding what they're trying to do. And then there's like enjoyment in watching it. So I, I can't I can't give it the five, but I did give it a perfectly respectable four. Mm, okay. Pretty good. Pretty, I'm surprised. pretty, pretty good. You thought I would uh, go harder mm. on the basis of what the violence? No, no, I thought you would give it a five. Oh, you thought I would? Oh, I've denied Mel. Yeah, three right. times. What does the audience think? Uh, everyone loves it. 55% five wikis in the early vote. And uh, two people are going to hell who gave it a one. <laughs> Enjoy your time with Satan and the snake. Uh, <laughs> um, the movie next week is Red Dawn, which uh, I I have to apologize to the audience. I didn't realize there was a remake of Red Dawn in 2012. So Red Dawn won the vote, and I'm 99.9% sure that the movie nominator, uh, Jason, was... He meant Red Dawn, the original from 1984. He did not mean the 2012 remake. So we're going to watch the 1984 original. And then after that, we have um, we have remaining nominations for April of Kelly's Heroes, The Sandlot, The Martian, Fury, End of Watch, Deep Water, Deep Water Horizon, 127 Hours, or of course you can reject the list in favor of a randomly selected top-rated movie instead. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read my movie reviews, comment how wrong I am, submit your own rating, Tell us we are going to hell for uh, the AI face swap art or sign up for the chance to be the movie nominator for the month. The one and only place to do it is in my weekly movie review column linked in the description and on the homepage of the website. That is mattchristensenmedia.com and or mattis.gay. All right. We'll catch up with chat. We'll call it an evening. Sure. Let's see. Uh, Over on Rumble, I just got a couple here. Addicted to drums. Christ is king. Thanks for supporting the show. And uh, I just can't believe there's that much hate in that heart, though. Uh, Happy Easter. Hottie Twerkman says the captain knew he should have checked for stowaways before leaving Baltimore the moment the lights went out. Rats, he said, as the the dolly drifted toward disaster. Rats. Uh, This would be the, the, the ship, the cargo ship guy in Baltimore, I gather. Is he saying rats because he's like rats this Rats, I'm frustrated, or is he saying that there are actual rats? Yeah. I the joke is too advanced for me. <laughs> I'm just, I, uh, thank you, Hottie Torkman. Link to the Future says, since you watched The Passion for Easter this year, The Crying Game would be the perfect film for you to watch next year. It's a crime thriller with a plot that's very relevant to the current holiday. Well, are you talking Easter or are you talking Trans Visibility Day? Which <laughs> holiday is it? I think you know to? the answer to that. The real holiday. Uh, all right, we're all set on Rumble. We're good on Odyssey, good on DLive. So let's catch up with uh, with YouTube and Tippy. Sure. Okay, Paul Porter, the Matt Asteroids movie theory. Like the game Asteroids, if a movie scores too high, Matt's brain flips. If it's a six, Susan, it becomes a Matt one on the day as Blade Runner, et cetera. If it's a seven, Lawrence of Arabia, it becomes a Matt two. If it's a seven... Interesting. Okay, for, first of all, you're saying you think Amadeus is a five plus? That's a fantastic film. That's a 
Nearly uh, perfect film. Blade Runner? How dare you? That's also excellent. Yeah. Lawrence of Arabia? It's like 50 yeah. years long. Yeah. No. Did we watch that? Lawrence of Arabia? Yeah. In fact, I don't think I, I don't think I even gave it a one. But I think he's, as he's saying, yeah, I think I probably gave it a two. So he's saying Lawrence of Arabia is actually a what seven. What was that? It must have been ages ago. I barely but remember. I, but I guess my only, okay, so I'm going to entertain this theory. Yeah, I don't remember when we actually watched it, but it's been a little while. I'm going to entertain this theory. You're saying that if I give it a two, it's a seven. But if I give it a one, it's a six. Yes. Shouldn't there be like an inversion here? Shouldn't the one actually be higher? The more, it. the more I hate it, the better the movie it actually is, is the theory, right? Yeah. All right. I just, dude. Okay. I mean, you're in time. I'm not going to get overly uh, bothered by your choice in movies in the same way I ask that people not do that to me. I'm just saying, if you ask a guy, <laughs> what are your favorite movies? And he says, Amadeus, Blade Runner, and Lawrence of Arabia. I would immediately think that guy was interesting and had excellent taste in film. I bet. Well, we could watch all of that right after Citizen Kane. I can't wait. Yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah, pe- yeah. People things say, but never uh, things people say. It's that time of night. Things people say, but never actually do. Watch those movies. Seriously, I would be like immediately have sex with that guy <laughs> that had that movie list. Offers on the table. All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're good over there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I already read. Well, what am I talking about? Guy is Alexander. My wife and I had our first son in 2022. We knew it was terminal. We decided to carry him full term. Anyway, a short life still has meaning and purpose. And as was discussed a few weeks back, we wouldn't have been able to live with ourselves knowing that we killed him. The wisdom of the Stoics and voluntary hardship got us through that loss. You can't control what happens in life, but you can control how you react to it and whether you let it destroy you. We welcomed our second son on the 19th. Congratulations. And are overjoyed to have him with us. Many blessings to you and your two families. Man, I know some people that have gone through this and it's just like, I, I cannot imagine. And this is the reason that I'm not having more children. I just, I don't, I like, I can't, I can't do it. If something like that happens, I just can't even imagine what that would be like. Well, God even bless you, man. I mean, that that's, pain. um, I have nothing but respect and admiration for the pain that you and your wife put yourself yeah. through to see to it, that you gave your son the best chance at life that he could possibly right. have. Right. That is the, uh, that is your highest obligation as a parent and you fulfilled it exactly the way that you should. And even though you, your family has obviously suffered through that experience, I guarantee that suffering is, is not nearly as bad as the suffering of wondering for the rest of your life. If you made the wrong choice to end the life of your child and you will yeah. never have to go and through that. And you can live a life without guilt. Too. Right. And there, and there's that. Um, and I hope that, this new child, although it'll never replace the child you lost, can ease your suffering to some degree. And that joy kind of fills that void. But yeah, I'm uh, sorry for your loss, but also congratulations. And yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, I can't say much more about it than that. I'm that's that's one of those things that that kind of leaves me a little bit speechless, to be honest. I just I my level of respect for that is beyond words. And I wish more people. Uh, if not did that, at least believed it. You know, now we kind of have the reversal where, oh, if there's a health complication then you just you get that taken care of and you try again. And like, no, I mean, that that you had a son that you got to know for the maximum amount of time that was possible. And that's because mm-hmm. of you uh, committing yourself to the right idea and to the value of that child's life. And so uh, I if it's in this life or the next, you will be rewarded for that. And you should be. And uh and and thanks for supporting the show and all the best to your yeah. family and congratulations on the new edition. Ryan Cunningham. No, no, thank you. Uh, Daniel Yeager. So I just saw this, but Cody Detweiler is embarking on trying to build a killdozer replica. Bought the Kumatsu bulldozer already. Wait, what? I don't, well, I don't know what one? any of this means. Uh, I, uh, I, oh, hold on. I got to find this chat. I lost it. Let me see. There's a, okay, wait. Okay, Cody Detweiler is embarking on trying to build a killdozer replica. Bought the oh, so okay, that's like the frame. This this bulldozer must have been the original frame bulldozer that uh, Marvin Heemeyer used, and so he's trying oh. to build a replica. So he bought the original. He's going to try to do the armor welding job. This guy, I don't know this guy, but he must be like a YouTuber or something. I can watch this. I, it sounds familiar. If I can watch a guy recreating the killdozer, I'm in. 
Uh, Whistlin um, Diesel is the guy's YouTube name. <laughs> he does creative. Is it a big channel. He does automotive stunts. So uh, yeah, it looks like he's pretty well established. I don't know. Here's a variety story on him. The YouTube channel. No, I, I can't find the channel here, but it's Whistlin Diesel. Okay, I won't cool. click around anymore. Waste, waste time. But thank you for the rec. I, I, I got to check that out. Long down, John. Matt and I once made love, and I know you can't wait to hear every juicy detail, Blonde, but Matt just sent a cease and desist letter uh, and left a threatening potato on my kitchen counter. That's disgusting. That was the other part about the, the Crowder bit. It's like, I is res- this potato more threatening than what you actually said? Well, that... Yeah, that's the angle, too. And I wish I would have gotten into that on my stream is like, OK, I get it that this is supposed to be a secret address at which your kids stay. You did, you did no, get into it on the stream. I got into that. But I, but I'm saying if the potato says watch it, effing watch it. <laughs> and that's a threat. How is him actually saying watch it, effing watch it? Not a threat. And Gerald, when he was talking about this on, on the Crowder response show said, well, even in that context, when when Stephen Crowder said that to his wife, who was pregnant at the time, you guys don't understand there's a context that explains why he would say that, that you're not keen on, but we're going to explain. And I'm, you know, I don't know what went on there, but I, I will say I'm somewhat sympathetic to things spoken in marriage being like my wife and I have almost our own separate language. I don't know if you guys experience that, but you have like inside jokes and all kinds of things that nobody on the yeah. outside of your marriage would ever understand or get. And if they became public, people would think they look bad or look weird. I'm not saying I've told my wife to watch it, effing watch it. I'm just saying there are things that we share that would look weird to an outsider. So when I hear that, I think, okay, I mean that I'm sympathetic to that claim. If you can explain it. Uh, but then I'm wondering, well, why the hell would this be written on a potato? Why? That doesn't, even if someone wanted to play a joke on him, like I'm going to send him in the mail a note Why that a says watching, watch it. F- and and watch they, it. they didn't like launch it through a window, right? It came in a box in the mail, they said. So then I'm wondering, does the inside joke have something to do with a potato? Is there some kind of inside know. joke in that family that would explain it? And if there is, <laughs> then that would make the potato non-threatening. But I, non-threatening. I don't understand what about the potato. I don't understand why it exists. I am left to assume there's a context in which that makes sense. But if there is a context in which that makes sense, it's probably not a threat. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So I don't know. Potato gate. Jared <laughs> is responsible for mailing. And, and the potato came within a mere multi-mile vicinity of the Vicinity Jared. of the, yeah. So maybe. How many miles? It was like 50 miles, right? No, I, I think they were saying a couple miles of his house, to be fair. Oh, so, okay. I mean, it's it's not... Still, though, it's not like the same, you know, yeah. I yeah, it, it's just, that was a weird, it was a very weird part of that show. Uh, long time, John. Matt and I made love. I just read that one. Um, VD says, on your show last week, Steamroller 1323 reached out to chat about Virginia job and a religious exception oh, yeah. letter. Could you connect us? I've helped write a few letters from a Christian perspective. Thanks. How oh, the VA them? job. Right, right, yeah. Not. Uh, oh, I did it again. Yeah, I think he means veterans affairs. Not, but he it is. It must mean veterans affairs. Nothing else makes sense. Uh, yeah, VV, uh, you can send me an email and uh, Steamroller. If you're still interested in some help on that, you can send me an email, and I'll be happy to connect you. Um, and thanks for the offer, VV. Um, only this clown show at this Kaiser and Gilroy administration can take Easter and turn it into a day where chicks with dicks are acknowledged. Memo to baby <laughs> Benny. Revelation 1916, Crisis King, it's God's law, bro. Fuck you. Fuck you. Uh, I got a, I don't know the scriptural reference, but let me see what it says. Uh, yeah, at least according to this translation, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I assume he being Jesus in this context, but uh, Christ is King would be a um, fair inference from that text. <laughs> I would say a reasonable yeah. conclusion. Yeah. Jonathan Prezios. Come on guys. Candace has an NDA not to talk to anything as I like her. She's playing games, letting false narratives spread without letting anyone defend themselves. This is all BS. Don't play into it. I haven't heard Candace say anything. Have you? Oh, uh, well, other than what we've talked about, if you're asking like, do I believe the story about the daily wire town hall? If I were betting I right know. now, I'm going to bet. Maybe. No, but I am interested in how this played out. So just, I want all the information to be out there and uh, considered. 
But do I think that that's true as told? My bet would be no. But if they're saying they're going to file a lawsuit on that basis, well, then we'll at least know that someone's putting their name to it. But yeah, um, I don't, I I would probably, I would actually disagree with the characterization that Candace is being tricky here, unless Candace is the source of that information, but Candace is saying she didn't know about it. So, I mean, I guess she could be the source and lie, but if she has not been feeding information, I've not seen her comment on this publicly at all, except for in response to the Ben commentary, unless I miss something. So, uh, I don't, I don't think that she's being sneaky in that way. But mm-hmm. I only see what's public. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You said you had a hard out, right? Do you need to uh, finish yeah, up? Yeah, I'll just do one more. Okay. For, for those of you that one of my dear friend, my dear internet friend is, is staying with me right now. Um, I'm super excited to see her. So I was going to do a Is it a secret day. who it is? Or are you? I don't know. Maybe. All well, right. She's, she gave up social media for Lent. Oh, So okay. I don't think that anybody knows that she's here. So Got it. Her here, but. Yeah. Internet friends. You know, most of the time when you meet somebody from the internet, they're wildly disappointing. There are a few exceptions to that. You were fine. And then Thank uh, you. Th- this chick is fine. Yeah. But I've met a few people where I'm like, wow, this is, I could not be more disappointed in you. You hmm. got to slay your heroes, your internet heroes. We're all kind of disappointing in their life. Anyway, not her. She's the best. Um, last one, Jonathan Peterson. Trump is a fake Christian, but I don't have any better choice. Prices came. Clavin was right. He is a fake Christian. I, that's, that's, I think that's a fair criticism of him. Well, uh, fake, like, does he not believe it at all? Or is he just bad in observing the faith? I don't know. Um, I think he's full. Is, is he the most devout guy? Certainly not. And I, I don't think Trump is, a. I mean, if I have criticisms of Trump, and I do, it's, it's on matters of principle. I think that he is mostly a go by his gut and reward people who are loyal to him type of guy rather than a, a strictly principled guy. Right. And I, I, I would be comfortable betting that extends to his religious philosophy or his philosophy of faith as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I would, I would hesitate to say fake in that. I think he, he at least believes in these things, even if he's not super, um, I don't know. He, he's not the observant. He, yeah. He's not the most well-practiced, I suppose. That's but true. I don't yeah. I don't think he's I, let's put it this way. I don't think he talks about these things solely to persuade people politically. I don't think he does it as a trick. I think he believes it, even if he you know believes all kinds of things sort of intermittently and sort of to know. his convenience sometimes. I think there might but, be an element of trickery there. Yeah, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to vote. So Clavin was right, though. I mean, yeah, I've already talked about that, that but. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. You mean that uh totally nonsensical argument that he was making? Whatever. Fine. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'll see you guys next Sunday. It's been real happy Easter. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and we will see you soon. All right. I'll see you next week. And I will uh finish out on chats here as always. Thank you guys for your patience. Daniel Yeager, never underestimate Joe Biden's ability to fuck things up, says Barack Obama. But here he is out saving the day for Joe Biden nonetheless. Laurel says the most important news of the day. Oh, sorry, I missed one. Lover of uh, green. By far the dumbest people in society are the people who still wear face napkins. If you still believe we're in a health emergency, even though it's been over since 2022, you're the DNC's ideal voter. Well, Taylor Lorenz is immunocompromised, she says. Um, and I'm surprised you're willing to say that it was even real into 2022, but, (laughs) uh, yeah, I'll take your point that, um, that there were more severe consequences happening back then than now. Certainly Laurel says the most important news of the day, I'm down 30 pounds. People rejoice. Well, you must've been working hard at the, uh, the old Missouri compound Laurel. I assume you got a lot of, um, a lot of things to build or who knows. Uh, but whatever's going on i'm I'm glad to hear it and congratulations to you and to your family and everything you're building uh down in missouri i hope it uh, works out for you christian staub is that how to pronounce it s-t-a-u-b staub in church i was wondering if god theologically answered the tw- the trolley car question is it justified to sacrifice one jesus in this case to save the many the souls of everyone else um god said yes i suppose i've never thought about jesus's death in that way that it was just the trolley car problem. Um, couple in general, uh, when it comes to the trolley car, like 
if people don't understand the trolley car problem, there's a trolley going down the tracks and it's headed toward, let me characterize this right. It's headed toward, say, 10 people who are tied to the tracks. It's going to run them over and kill them. You are an observer and you have a switch for the tracks that would change the trolley's direction to go a different way and it would hit instead one person who's tied to those tracks and kill him. So the moral question is, would you be justified in switching the trolley's path to kill one person instead of 10? Or is the moral thing to sit back and allow the train to run over 10 people and kill them? There is no scenario in which everyone lives. And um, in general, my philosophy on that is that uh, the, the fault of that situation the moral fault lies with the bizarre terrorist who set up this scenario. So you do not have a moral obligation to make any decision that would kill a person. And so I don't, I don't think that you should be making those God playing God in that way, deciding who lives, deciding who, you know, deciding who should die, that sort of stuff. And people will always say, Oh, come on. Um, you, you would, you wouldn't uh, trade one person for 10,000. Well, I don't think that I that my role is deciding what life is valuable and what life isn't. And so if there is fault in this situation that will necessarily result in death, it's the fault of the crazy person who designed this situation and determined there will be innocent lives lost. So I don't put the fault, the moral fault, on the person making that selection. Again, it would be my selection not to meddle with this switch and supposedly save lives by killing other people because the moral principle there is if I if I judge that my action will save people by killing people, I'm justified in killing people in pursuit of those ends. And I think that thinking is behind uh, a lot of potentially evil acts. But I've never thought about the about the the story of Jesus or Jesus's sacrifice in that context. I would say if I had to square them, I mean, if, if God himself is moral perfection, then whatever choice God makes in that scenario is the morally correct one by definition, I suppose. Kind of gets back to the question of like, is God capable of immorality? If he is, uh, well, then there's a lot of um, a lot of potential imperfections in this God, I suppose. But if if the definition of morality or what is good or what is wrong if what is good is that which is in pursuit to God's will, and when I say that, I kind of mean like in harmony with the rules of the world by which we all operate. If that's the definition of morality, then God's decision by definition is moral. I don't know. I'm trying to, if I'm not making sense here, that's because I'm trying to wrap my mind around a, a very, a, 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 an adaptation to this hypothetical that I've never thought about before. In general and in closing, I don't think you should make choices that result in the deaths of people, even when you think you're doing it to save other people. And whenever people make, whenever people go to those extremes, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't kill one to save 10,000. Oh, you wouldn't kill one to prevent the nuclear bomb from going off. Well, the very fact that you have to go to extremes to try to disprove this rule is actually demonstration of the rule. If it's hard to say, well, should you kill one to save two? Should you kill one to save three? I mean, that's really the the core of, of the rule here, the principle at stake. Uh, is it justified to kill one person? Is it justified to kill a person to save others? A lot of times that premise is very flawed and you're actually just killing people, which uh, is, <laughs> is, of course, uh, very morally serious. Anyway, thanks for the thoughts, man. Uh, I'm sure I could probably do a better job on that question if I had some time to sit down and think about it but I appreciate your support for the show and, uh, and the question esoterica unbound. I'm surprised blonde overlooked the possibility that Jared has been bought off by <laughs> that. Jared has been bought off by, is it pronounced the Jews to fan the Crowder stink? So as to take the heat off Shapiro and his Zionist conspiracy against sassy black chicks. Wow. This is deep. Uh, has anyone, well, I guess people have speculated that maybe he's like a, a, a an agent, a, a saboteur on behalf of the Daily Wire. I know that Jeremy Boring and Daily Wire employees were named in the the deposition petition from Crowder as in who they're seeking to investigate Jared's communications with. So maybe the Daily Wire is secretly trying to get uh, stop big con revenge on Crowder and Jared has become their agent. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 a little too much speculation for me at this point, but 
Uh, if evidence comes out to that effect, that'll be an interesting angle. Purpose of the Ages Ministries. Jesus and his posse were up against armed guards. He predicted that all who protect him will surely die, possibly even Jesus himself. This was not pacifism, and it was... Uh, it, this was not pacifism. It was protection of his prophecy death. Thanks for the um, the thoughts on that. That would clarify what he's saying there a little bit more. If I understand what you're saying, he's saying, hey, man, lay down the sword because the sacrifice that I'm about to go through is the path that I'm supposed to take. And uh, we need not intervene in it, I suppose, is what you're saying. Not necessarily a moral opposition to all applications of violence, even those in self-defense. Thanks for that. I, I hope... Um, I, as of now, we don't have plans to do the Gospel of Matthew in the Bible study, but the Bible study is ongoing. By the way, it's coming back soon, so stay tuned for an announcement on that. But if or when we get into that, I will be curious to discuss that point. And I think we're all set. Thank you, uh, Purpose of the Ages Ministries. I think we're all set on... Uh, oh, we have one more on, on Rumble. Since you watched... Oh, wait, wait, that was the crying game one. No, we got that one. My mistake. We're good on Odyssey. We're good on DLive. We'll give a quick refresh here, and we'll call it a night. Looks like we're all set. So uh, thank you guys once again for spending your uh, your Easter and Trans Day of Visibility evening with us. Appreciate your super chats. Appreciate your live chats. Appreciate your live contributions to the show. If you're listening later on demand, thank you kindly as well for supporting the show. If you'd like more to listen to, got lots more over on the website. Not only my Wednesday show, the Matt Christensen Hour on Tenant Media, I've got other interviews, uh, material you might not find on YouTube and the audio platforms of the show. Head on over to mattchristensenmedia.com slash podcasts. You can find lots more to listen to there. Speaking of anything show related, you want to pick up a t-shirt, you want to find the latest episode of the show, you want to see the videos I post during the week, any of that stuff, any and all the content, mattchristensenmedia.com. We'll be back next Sunday, because if it's Sunday, it's not Meet the Press. It is the Matt and Blonde Show. Have a happy Easter and a good night. Thanks for tuning in.